Episode 17, 2016. I know not how to aid you, save in the assurance of one of mature age and much severe experience that you cannot fail if you resolutely determine that you will not fail. Now, on Inside the Buffalo... Wait! Wait, wait, wait. Can't use that title. How about this? All right. Folks, we've made it to the final episode of Down and Drought. Quiet on the set. (laughs) We did it. We did it after so many weeks. We are at the final episode of Down and Drought. It's 2016. Don't think about the fact that the set looks a little different behind us. There is absolutely nothing to look into about this whatsoever. I'm Prescott Rossi. He's Thad Brown. Joining us fresh from his honeymoon. Congratulations on your marriage. You got called up. Dan Fates (laughs) joins us for the final episode. And uh, Dan, you've been uh, watching along throughout this stretch. What have you learned about the Buffalo Bills? You're from Western New York. What, What do you know and what have you gained from from this exercise. Sadness, is yeah. it, is, is it, that's probably the best way, but all of, I went to Fredonia, all my friends were big Bills fans, so I, I lived through a lot of this too, and, and it's, it's impressive to go back there, and, and for me it was the Tebow during the 2014 season and all of those games, but uh, this one, uh, this, this year is pretty special too. Yeah, the, the, this year uh, has a lot going on, so we won't really waste much time. Right at the start of 2016 on Saturday, Sunday, January 10th at 4 p.m., Kim Pagula tweets out, because this is the modern era, this is how news breaks nowadays, tweets a photo from the family yacht of Doug Whaley signing a contract extension along with Russ Brandon and Terry Pagula. We talked about in the last episode about the McCoy trade going down while they were on their yacht. Now they're making more moves with the front office uh, on the yacht. But, fellas, your thoughts of uh, Doug Whaley? Now, uh, for sure, inking a new deal with the Buffalo Bills. This one was significantly more questionable, for sure. I mean, what had Doug Whaley done to this point that was really, wow, we need to hold on to this guy. You know, Rex Ryan, in one year, went from savior, five-year contract, to just abject failure. You know, his, his golden boy, his first draft pick, E.J. Manuel, was already, you know, a backup at best to where the trading away of Matt Castle had inspired enough angst as for, the, for the contest to be the backup. This is, this is what your first-round quarterback franchise guy had become. So no one had any confidence that Doug Whaley knew what he was doing, and the Bills locking themselves up to multi-years more of this met was, was met with zero enthusiasm whatsoever. It's, it's just weird because it's like, oh, no, there's confidence in him. There's confidence in him. But everybody else was kind of going, there's not that much confidence. <laughs> and, and everybody was already going into this year being like, well, it's playoffs. They've got to make the playoffs. It's got to make the playoffs. you got to earn it. And, yeah, no, it, that, it's why we're doing this. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, it's a three-year extension on Whaley's deal, so it would be uh, four more years of Doug Whaley. Four more years yeah. <laughs> uh, in Western New York. Well, the same day, later that very night at 9 o'clock, Alex Marvez, then with Fox Sports, tweets that Rob Ryan – is going to join the Bills coaching staff as a defensive coach. Uh, then an hour later, the Bills make that move official that Rob Ryan is coming in. And isn't it just a miracle how there are so many coaches out there, but Rex Ryan was able to find one that just happens to be in the family tree. And Rob Ryan joins the Bills, so nepotism is alive in the See, NFL. See, the, the nepotism part of it never bothered me. I mean, the, these NFL staffs are like 35 guys. So <laughs> if you want to look, if, if Terry Pagula is going to let you spend his money to bring your brother in, <laughs> And we think he knows maybe a little bit about football. Maybe not that much. Not as much as his brother, who wasn't really any good anyway. But, look, whatever. There's so many spots on the coaching staff. If Rex wanted to bring Rob in and thought it would help out, nothing he did the year before helped, so let's give this a run. Hey, sweet live ass, Rob. No doubt. <laughs> At the end of the day, you realize, like, hey, you know what? Come help me. You know, don't don't go help somebody else. Come help me. <laughs> I've learned a lot, of, a lot of great football from Bill Belichick, and, and I think – uh, he didn't learn you know, anything from me, but I learned a ton from him. So, When Rob Ryan was fired as the defensive coordinator in New Orleans, the Saints were allowing 424.7 yards oh, per game. He was bad. I yeah. mean, you know, he was from, bad a lot. From a football point of view, it was terrible. Because yeah. what, what is this guy going to do to help your team? From an Edmonton point of view, I didn't care. You know, whatever. Yeah. Go ahead. He was coach. just a bad coach. Whether <laughs> he was your brother or not, he was a bad coach. It, it kind of felt like the whole thing was brought together. To, to give Rex a buddy, you know, yeah. someone to bounce stuff off Absolutely. of. Absolutely. Just like, I, you know, I need a friend. Yeah, I need it. someone to hug me at night. You know, that <laughs> This defense thing. is going to work. Dad's going to be so proud of yeah. us. Like, that, that, that was, that's what it was. That was legitimately another part of it because yeah. they had never coached together. You know, and I mean, Rex probably knew that his chances as a head coach were 
few and you know not <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. right so they had you know and, and we laugh about it but if, if you're in the family and you've been a coach forever and you've never been on the same team you can think about the fact that we want to at least try it for one last hurrah. exactly yeah. yeah well he gains another friend as the bills hire ed reed to be their defensive mm -hmm. backs coach a couple days later assistant db uh coach wednesday january 20th a uh, big day in the history of the national football league uh, as the Bills hire Catherine Smith to be mm -hmm. special teams quality control coach, the first woman to ever land a full-time assistant job in the NFL. Um, she has a history of working under Rex Ryan in different capacities, but never anything this official. Um, I remember being, was like, oh, I had no real thoughts of it other than like, oh, that's amazing that no one had been mm -hmm. a full-time female coach in the NFL until that point. But, you know, special teams quality control coach, it's low on the totem pole. I want to say this without without making it sound like a joke, without laughing at it legitimately. Probably the best thing Rex Ryan did in Buffalo. I mean, so, you, you yeah, think about sure. it, you know, <laughs> all the stuff sure. that what he accomplished, and it was it, it made you feel good about the game and the sport and and 2016 and the era we were in. And you know, she was like you said, as far down the total pole as you get as a coach, but she had a job, you know, and, and that was no small thing. Yeah, and I remember uh, when the Bills had uh, mini camp, uh, they brought her to the press. It was the first time she had ever really been available. And uh, Scott Swenson, who's a uh, photographer at WIVB in Buffalo, was like, my daughters, you know, they know what I do for a living. They, <laughs> they watch football. They see you, and they're inspired by you. Mm -hmm. And you could see in Catherine Smith's face that she was almost getting a little choked up, and she yeah. did a good job to kind of not get, let the emotions get to her. It is a big deal, but I hope that what they see is that I've gotten this far by working hard, and I'm going to continue to do that and focus on the job and the task at hand. So hopefully that shines through to them as well and, and maybe that's what they can take from it. So, uh, you know, a, a lot of kudos to the Bills, Rex Ryan and obviously to Catherine Smith for landing that job. Well, the good news doesn't last very long for the Buffalo Bills during the Rex Ryan era. I mean, we all know this. Monday, February 8th, LaShawn McCoy is a suspect by Philadelphia police for the assault of two off-duty police officers at a nightclub. Now, this nightclub is the Recess Lounge in Philadelphia, which is an old city Philly. And I just happen to have a sister that lives in Philadelphia, like practically the around the corner <laughs> from the Recess Lounge. And Old City, if you don't know Philadelphia, is a nice part of Philly. It's, you know, it's where all the old things are. It's, you turn one way, there's Independence Hall, and over there, there's the Liberty Bell. Well, my sister's apartment just happens to be in this neighborhood. And when I was there for Eagles training camp, because a couple of Rochester guys were in the Eagles camp then, I parked my car in a garage not knowing that the recess lounge is in the first floor of that parking garage. You would have had no idea. It's just a, a building with some blackened out windows and a sign that just says recess over it. You would have walked by it a million times. So that's just a little scene setter about <laughs> where the recess lounge is. But uh, dispute began over a bottle of champagne and oh man, the hot takes were flying. The weird thing about this incident was, okay, athlete gets in trouble. We've heard the story a thousand times. And LaShawn McCoy is 100% a diva. You know, the guy who is a superstar and you know, he expects to be treated differently than everyone else, especially. And we saw that last year with how he interacted with Chip Kelly. That's exactly right. what I was gonna point out. We're, yeah. we're exactly where I was going next. So the idea that LaShawn McCoy got into trouble at a bar fight, you know, a lounge because someone stole a bottle of champagne from him, totally believable. The weird thing about this was is that after the initial announcement came out, everything following that implicated the police as being the ones who started the fight, yeah. did everything wrong. <clears throat> LaShawn was really wrong place, wrong time. No, and just the way that it was, you started here, and then everything else was whew, there. Yeah. And you did it in like three weeks, month, yep. however yep. long it was. It was quick to where, yeah. oh, LaShawn's going to be in trouble. Oh, he's not really in trouble. And there was video that kind of came out, but it's blurry, and it's, it's him, but it's not him, and who started it, and, and this happened. It was kind of the, the circus, but like you said, it was... Well, he, he, he didn't really do anything. It was, yeah. it, was, it was back and I thought it was a little bit back and forth. I was still in Elmira at the time, and we're yeah. still running it all the time because, oh, this is a big deal and all this stuff. Oh, but, we ran it all the time. Yeah. Oh, that that yeah. was a big deal yeah. every well, day. Yeah. Well, the Fraternal Order of Police in Philadelphia goes bananas over this. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, the mayor of Philadelphia is saying that LaShawn McCoy should go to prison mm. and all that stuff. Well, the district attorney two months later says no charges, mm. and we can't prove who started the fight which, you know, district attorneys work with police officers all the time. Mm. The district attorney doesn't know, mm, the police are pretty involved in this too. Full disclosure, not too long after that, the district attorney was busted for taking bribes from famous people. So, you know, perhaps like, at the end of the day, <laughs> at the end of the day, we, we, it, it, so not gonna be in trouble, yeah. but just so we right. know what happened with Mistakes the Mistakes were made yeah. by several people. <laughs> That's it. Uh, so as we advance into free agency, right at the start of free agency, or right as free agency is about to begin, Monday, March 7th, the Bills tender Chris Hogan uh, with a bottom priority tender. Now, since he was undrafted, the Bills would receive no compensation if he landed anywhere else. 
Well, four days later, he ends up in New England with the Patriots on a three-year, $12 million contract. The Bills don't match it. Um, and then Hogan becomes not a huge part of a Super Bowl winner, but a part of a Super Bowl winner. And the Bills now lose depth at the wide receiver position. Fellas, your thoughts on Chris Hogan um, going to the enemy in the uh, AFC East? The thing you had to remember about this offseason, the Bills had no money to work with. No, they had no, no cap Entered room. with $7 million of right. cap room. And they had to re-sign Richie Incognito, and they had to sign re-sign Cordy Glenn. And of those three guys, you know, which guy are you going to leave? It's going to be Chris Hogan every day and twice on Sunday. So the Bills maybe could have tendered him a little higher to grab a draft pick out of it if someone had signed him away. But at the end of the day, they did not have the cap room to retain Chris Hogan. And I don't care if they went to New England. He's yeah, a, exactly. a fourth receiver at best. It wasn't that big a deal. The Bills got rid of a guy they couldn't afford. Did you know he played lacrosse at Penn State? <laughs> what? And again, and, and this is, again, it's because he goes to the evil empire. It's because he now goes and does all these things. And, oh, he, he's going to burn us. He's going to burn us. It's like, don't let Chris Hogan beat you. I don't, I don't know. Like, it's Chris <laughs> Hogan. Let's be Wait, straight. If he would have gone anywhere else, yeah. it's not a story. The, P the Bills were going to get burned by whichever receiver was in that position for exactly. New England. <laughs> Tom Brady could have burned the Bills with the three of us. What is it, coach? <laughs> And uh, also at the start of free agency, the Bills released Mario Williams, Leotis McKelvin, Booby Dixon, and Craig Urbick. So uh, just pour a little out for, uh, for Mario and Booby and Leotis. Some, some guys that we love talking to, one guy not so much. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the, the Mario Williams era came in with so much high hopes. And it just goes out with a whimper right at the start of free agency. And not only a whimper, but he had gotten into such a disagreement. And it wasn't just him, but he was the ringleader with Rex over scheme. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the day, there are, you know, Preston Brown is more or less calling him out for uh, not being a guy who uh, was giving a crap, for lack of a better term. Um, you know, Mario had worn out his welcome. It was the easiest cut the Bills ever made. And Booby Dixon was so much fun to talk oh, to. Man. I went up to one training camp. They, it was when the first day of training camp that uh, the year before, mm -hmm. again in Elmira, and Booby Dixon just was stole the show. You know, I'm just happy right now, man. You know, uh, we did we doing this for Buffalo. You know, the whole community. You know, we try we trying to break the streak. We focus on breaking that streak. You know, and uh, I think we got a good shot at it. He was not. He wasn't Fred Jackson likable, but he was a guy that fans got behind. He was a fun guy and. Just wasn't room. Yeah, I mean, uh, and Booby Dixon had his limits. I mean, no oh, one is. Oh, as a player, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was good on special teams, but you know, he was maybe the best quote in that yes. Bills yes. locker room. Yes. McKelvin was great for a different <laughs> reason because he talked so fast with the thickest Cajun accent you'd ever mm -hmm. heard, and that was amazing. But uh, but yeah, uh, Leotis uh, ends up going to the Eagles, so it's not like he's you know out of football, though he may be soon. Yeah. Uh, is he even still on the team anymore? He's still on the team. Yeah, still he's still, there you go. Yeah. Well, Monday, April 18th, a uh, rather uneventful day uh, as the Bills, um, I believe, were in OTAs at that point. And, uh, you know, kind of going through the routine. We get to the Rex Ryan press conference. I believe I was the only one there uh, out of the News 8 Sports Department. And Rex is talking, and, you know, it's going over the offseason optimism, hopes, and all that. Then right at the end, Vic Carucci asks, Rex, uh, a couple more. Here. The, yeah, there's a, there's a rumor that you are introducing Donald Trump tonight. Is that true? Well, I don't know. We'll have to stick around and find out. <laughs> yeah, it should be interesting. And then, like, as if, like, the oxygen had been sucked out of the media room at one Bill's drive. Like, wait, what? Hmm. Like, Rex is, <laughs> Rex is what? Like, we're writing, like, boring tweets about Tyrod Taylor or something. And, yeah, and in here, April. Yeah. yeah, in April. And here comes Rex saying that he's going to introduce Donald Trump at a rally in Buffalo. So he has your endorsement for... The Republican. Oh my gosh. See, that's the thing. See, I'm going to introduce him. That's true. That's a true statement. But I'm not going to say who my endorsement is and all that stuff. You guys know, I I'll, will I'll, say this. Chris Christie was my guy 100% because we were the lap band of brothers. We both had that lap band and we really are pretty close. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, there were hot takes when uh, LaShawn McCoy was a suspect. There were hotter takes oh, for man. this. <laughs> Let me, I, was, I was in the Bahamas on the annual spring family vacation. Oh, yeah. And never had been more excited to be out of the Bills media. Well, it was this and when Mario was signed. The three-day Mario wait <laughs> and this were the two, the two best days I've missed in Bills history. I, 
the only thing that I thought about it, I was just laughing like crazy because I was not going to have to be involved in this. This was going to be one of the nutty, nuttier yep. Rex things. Yep. And uh, I just had another drink and sat back down and, <laughs> and watched the Twitter fun roll in. Uh, that was, I, and like I said, we, I wasn't here at the time yeah, yet, yeah. but I just remember. And, and like I said, and this was so polarizing figure in politics and a loud mouth and the division in the locker room. And Rex was and, there too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and there was a football team <laughs> involved in that too. So it was just, like I said, it was that perfect nightmare of anytime you thought Rex, would, it was a boring Bills day. Anytime you thought that, yep. it was just, just wait a second. Yeah. Like I said, <laughs> Put your arms out, let the story fall to you. See, let's see what happens. And <laughs> that, boom, there it is. We should explain that. That became a running joke. And the, you guys this, came this up with yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, was, it was in this starts, 2016 season. There would starts be, the preseason. See, yeah, there would be days, whether it be training camp, even during the regular season, there'd be a Wednesday. And, you know, as we go through the schedule, you'll know when these moments come up where you're just kind of like, eh, what's the storyline today? What are we going to talk about? And you just hold your arms out, wait for the story <laughs> to just fall from the heavens to land in your and arms. It was, it was always. So consistent. It was, it was so dependable. Like, <laughs> man, we're gonna have to make something out of this Wednesday. This, there's nothing They're going on. They're playing Jacksonville. Like, like, wait yeah. for it. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Oh, Rex is gonna introduce <laughs> Trump. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Carlos Williams. It was just like it was. Yeah. It was on key every time. It really was uh, quite an era with Rex Ryan. Well, the NFL draft Thursday, April 28th through the 30th. 10:15 p.m. The Bills select Shaq Lawson, defensive end out of Clemson, with the 19th overall pick. Six minutes later, yes. Adam Schefter reports that Lawson <laughs> will need shoulder surgery with a four to six month recovery time and will likely happen after the 2016 season. Five minutes later, Doug Whaley is at the podium and all everyone wants to ask is, you drafted a guy with an injured shoulder? And like <laughs> literally within 10 minutes it went from, the Bills might have the steal of the draft to, oh no, their rookie may not play in 2016. <laughs> And I thought Whaley handled it terribly. If they had just come out and said, oh, look, yeah, wait, wait, get out of here. I know, I know. Really shocker, shocker. <laughs> Medical staff cleared him, said he can play. Now, if something happens, it's, it's, it's going to happen. But it's nothing that uh, we're, we're really worried about or we wouldn't have taken him. We got complete faith in our medical staff, and they signed off on him, so we're excited to have him. If, if the Bills had just come out and said, look, we know his shoulder is damaged, but we think he's worth, like, the fourth pick in the draft or you think he's the best player in the draft and yeah look we might not have him until Halloween or even 2017 I mean, it might not have gone over as well but regardless you know if if you could take a guy who's that much better than your draft slot and all you lose out of it is the first seven games of his career I mean you can sell that you know mm -hmm. now I think there was a debate about how much the Bills needed to win that year whatever the, the bottom line is to come out and be like no he's fine and then legitimately he has surgery like a month later. Yep. It was awful, you yep. know? And that happens all the time. Somebody's great, whether it's an off the field issue or another reason, they fall the board and then you go, well, he's too good to pass on. He's, yeah. you know, just one thing or another. But like you said. Larry Tunsil. Well, yeah, it's, it, it, but, and you go back to it and it's like, no, nah, he's fine. Trust me. Schefter doesn't know what he's talking about. He's yeah. just, yeah. He's, he's, and, he's, and that's the thing is that defiance, that like, no, 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 that guy's wrong. Well, you better be right. Well, that yeah. carried on all through this <laughs> year. And, and, Shaq, and Shaq backed it up, too, in this one yeah. case. He was yeah. a, I will not need surgery. I'm yeah. going to play. Yeah, and the very next day, Shaq has his introductory press conference and says, you know, there's nothing to be worried yeah. about. I feel totally fine. So to clarify, do you expect to need surgery at any point? Uh, no, sir. Oh, I've been, I've been hearing about it for like four or five months. Uh, I'm, I know I'm, I'm just ready to play football and 100%. And then in the second round, because uh, you know there were still more picks to make in the 2016 NFL Draft, the Bills draft Reggie Ragland, a guy that Whaley said, hey, if he was, the, we were thought it, thinking of taking him at 19 had Jack Lawson not been available. And I remember being very excited about the Ragland pick, a linebacker out of Alabama. Good guy. I mean, at the time I thought this was another Doug Whaley overpay in the draft. He overpaid to trade up for Sammy Watkins. Yes. And he overpaid with this deal too. I think it was a second and a fourth to move Correct. up. And, and if you look at the draft chart, trade chart, whatever, it was way more than he needed to pay to go up like six spots. Eight. So eight spots. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was still way too much. Yeah. But um, yeah, you didn't. You did not like Reggie Ragland. It made sense. They yeah. needed a linebacker, and, and he was a good player. We thought from Alabama. Like yeah, yeah sure, absolutely. Nothing oh, bad ever happens to Alabama guys. That's by it. The way. That's it. Especially yeah. on the defensive side. Right. Not so much quarterbacks, but defensive, <laughs> defensive <laughs> linemen and linebackers. Take them. Offensive linemen too. They uh, tend to come out of college a, a little damaged. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. hey, uh, Reggie yeah. Ragland would also. Cyrus Quanjo. End up yeah. damaged. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. The third uh, third round pick, pick 80. The Bills draft Adolphus Washington. So a third straight defensive pick to open up. Who might not make it to training camp? Who might not make it to training camp in 2017? because of a gun charge uh, just happened a couple weeks ago. Their fourth round pick, 139, 
Cardale Jones, quarterback out of Ohio State. Now, had the Bills not traded their fourth round pick to Chicago to go up and draft Reggie Ragland, they would have had a possibility of drafting my favorite quarterback, Dak Prescott. Wonder why. Um, but they didn't, and so they ended up with Cardale Jones. And I remember being very excited about mm -hmm. Cardale. He won a national title with the Buckeyes, a cannon for an arm. Undefeated. Didn't have a ton of starts. You know, he didn't have a lot of playing time at Ohio State. Really, like but, <laughs> well, yeah, it was, it was like, yeah, it was like. Yeah. I think it was yeah, you're yeah, right, because yeah. then he lost his job during to the Braxton season. Braxton Miller, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I just remember, you know, hey, Cardale, there you go. That could be a very yeah. serviceable backup, and he can beat E.J. Manuel out for the backup role. Yeah. Why not? This guy's driven. This guy's a proven winner. He's undefeated. Uh, everybody talks about his accuracy, but you look at his completion percentage, it's over 60. I mean, he had a 105 quarterback rating against ranked teams. And again, he's undefeated. All I'm saying is, we got a, a nice guy to work with with a high upside. So we're excited to have him. It was certainly a good roll of the dice in the fourth round. You know, yeah. and I remember I never th uh, followed Bills fans so excited to make a fourth round pick and then get with the guy right. they wanted to. People love that pick. And you get it. If, if Look, it was a, um, a hit or miss, you know, or a big swing and a miss. If they hit, it's a grand slam. If you miss, well, it's a fourth round pick. Who cares? And what's wrong with taking swings and misses on quarterbacks in the fourth round? No, nothing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that, Worked out for Dallas. Yeah. Yeah, sure did. And then, uh, and then rounding out the 2016 draft, fifth pick, fifth round pick, Jonathan Williams, running back out of Arkansas, sixth round, Colby Listenby, wide receiver out of TCU, six, and then uh, Kevon, <laughs> Kevon Seymour, pick 218, uh, also out of USC. So, uh, yeah, I would not say that the 2016 NFL draft has uh, paid off well for the Bills. No, but a lot of it's injury related. Their first two yeah. picks, you know, one one injury they should have known about. The other injury is we may get to later in camp. Totally not their fault. It just happens. So we will see about this draft class. Seymour might still play. Listen to me, he's already off the roster. Washington might be off before we actually put this on out, out to, for people to consume it. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Peek behind the curtain. We're taping this on, mon on Monday? Monday, Monday yeah. and it'll drop Thursday. Yeah. So yeah, he might be gone by then. And, and this question, like I said, and you look at these draft classes, and there are all the statistics of how many rookies took snaps for teams this year, and the Bills were at the very bottom of it yeah. because you don't know what these guys are going to pan out because they weren't on the field at all last year. <laughs> so like when you, you had Raglan and you had Lawson, you don't know. They're those, I'll tell you what though, from, from what people thought of those two guys, I don't think they're changing the Bills season round. It wasn't like if, if they play the 16 games. Bills fans think that. Oh, yeah, they're getting right? two picks this year. Like mm -hmm. that's how you have to try and sell it almost. Well, that, I'm talking about 2016 though. Okay. If right. those guys were healthy last year, oh, right. it's not like the Bills were making no. the playoffs. I mean, there were some games that if just a couple plays go their way, they might have won nine, ten games. We'll get to that. No. <laughs> no. I'm disagreeing. Dot, dot, I, don't, dot. I don't think Shaq was that good. I mean, now, maybe if he was healthy the whole time, had a full training camp, different. But Shaq really wasn't, he wasn't made for Rex's 3-4. Nope. Yeah. In fact, like, when, when Shaq got healthy, you know they tried him at middle linebacker for a little while? Yeah, it didn't, it didn't work. Look at, watching that on film was one of the funny, <laughs> what is he doing there? Shaq, what are they thinking? Shaq's not a media guy, and you can almost poke him enough. And he said now he, he likes the 4-3 much better than that 3-4. Mm -hmm. So maybe this, maybe this fits better for Shaq. I mean, <laughs> I guess if Whaley wants to be like, ah, I knew it, I knew it. He can look back this oh, year on the God, couch yeah. and go, I knew yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> Monday, May 16th at 2.45 p.m., the Bills announced that Shaq Lawson will undergo <laughs> shoulder surgery. There we go. In a statement, the Bills say the recurrence of the injury happened during rookie camp the week before. Rookie camp. Right. There are no pads. They're barely wearing helmets. There's nothing. They're in shorts. And, uh, yeah, he damages his shoulder, and he'll be out till week eight. The best part of that was uh, Whaley trying to laud Lawson for doing a good job and taking the surgery now and giving up some of your Smart. production for the first year of the season. If they just, if again, if the Bills had just come clean about this yeah. and said, look, he's hurt, but that's why we got him at 19. He's really good. Well, fine. Well, the fun on May 16th doesn't end because two hours later at 422, Tyler Dunn of the Buffalo News reports that Sammy Watkins has a broken foot and had surgery last month. They're hopeful to get him for training camp. The details are starting to emerge about Sammy Watkins and his injured left foot. Watkins says he doesn't know when the injury occurred and that the Bills medical staff spotted it during a routine evaluation. Watkins was seen in a walking boot here at the start of the second week of Bills OTAs. Watkins hopes the boot will come off Thursday. As for the next time we'll see him in a Bills uniform, that date is a bit harder to pin down. Honestly, I can't tell you. Um, this is an injury where you got to be very careful. And um, like I said, the only thing I can do is listen to the staff and take it slow and um, just really protect myself. And they're going to protect me also. And uh, we're just going to take the course with the injury. Nobody's know what timetable or what, when I'm going to be back. Now, the injury list for Sammy Watkins, who's only played two seasons in the NFL, includes ribs, hip, calf, ankle, and now a broken foot. 
the Tyler Dunn report after the Shaq report was <laughs> surreal. It was, are you kidding? Another thing today? Yeah. Another major thing On to Monday, a major player? May 16th. Yeah, in the middle of May. Yeah. <laughs> Dan, Dan's doing it. It, it. I couldn't, I remember looking at the tweet and I'm like, I got to rearrange my show again for this now? Yep, yep. Yeah, what a stupid, stupid day in uh, the middle of May yeah. for the Buffalo Bills. Then on Friday, June 17th, a couple days after my wedding, right before I went on my honeymoon, Friday, June 17th, as minicamp ends, what a perfect way before a vacation. Rex Ryan says, we've won the offseason. After this week, the Bills won't meet on the same field until training camp at St. John Fisher in Pittsburgh at the end of July. And with a few weeks left to themselves, who better to leave a parting motivational message than one Rex Ryan. I told our players today that to win July, we've won the offseason. I, I would challenge any team. I, I think we've won the offseason. Um, but we need to win July. You know, I, and that's one that I shouldn't say because they're going to kill me anyway. But we're on vacation. Nobody's going to read it anyway. <laughs> so, but I do. I feel like, I mean, again, I, I don't know how about these other teams. I'm sure they've had some great camps too, but. I've been I've been really impressed with this group. Uh, I don't know what you've heard from the last 30 minutes or so that would indicate yeah. that, but um, okay, Rex. Mm -hmm. That was really the, the thing. Like, how did Rex get to this point? You know, yeah. what, what has gone good about their offseason? Oh well, they've trained really well, and they're you know they're, oh. they seem to be in good shape. <clears throat> Carlos Williams notwithstanding, they're like things are going well for the Buffalo Bills, and they've won the offseason. Now they need to go out and win. The month of July. I mean, there are pinata statements that fall out of Rex's mouth all the time. This one probably got beaten more than most, but we've seen 3,000 of them. Just, you know, we wish there was more candy that came along with it. <laughs> That's good. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> that would make the media room even more fun. But even at the end of 2016, Rex kind of was like reflective at the end of some of these bad beats. And was like, well, maybe, you know, if I didn't talk so much and didn't run my mouth so much, it's like, okay, Rex, he's going to turn a page. He's going to be this new coach. It's like, nope, he's the same guy yeah, and he's going to yep. go down with the ship the way that he wants it to go. And I remember being there for that press conference when he said we've won the offseason and <sighs> everybody was like, wait, what did you just say? Yeah. And like, he was asked multiple times, like, when you say we've won the offseason, like, he, like, he just, it was just offhand. He goes, we yeah, won the offseason. It was in his opening statement. We won the offseason and I challenge anyone to say otherwise. Like, he right doubled down. That he goes, I'm probably going to get killed in the media for this. Yeah. And then <laughs> says it, like, yes, you are. Like, Rex, what, Rex is fatal flaw. Like, you know, he knows it, he understands it, but he does it anyway. Whew. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, quite something. Of it. And saying how we need to win the month of July. Well, in the month oh, of July, yeah. on Thursday, July 14th, Jonathan Williams arrested for DWI in Kansas. Then on Friday, July 15th, the very next day, Carlos Williams suspended four games for substance, abu substance abuse. This after showing up to off-season workouts overweight. He said uh, that he was eating with his wife while she was pregnant with their child. Uh, it was busted for weed. The Carlos Williams saga. Saga, and, and a second year player who <laughs> it was, was on like the team. a comet. It came yeah. and just burned out like a 14 star. months. He was basically on the team. Yeah, he was so good his rookie year. I, I will not remove the Bills management from responsibility. And when I mean management, I mean Terry Pagula on down. Now, a lot of these guys are already fired as it is, Doug Whaley, Rex Ryan. But to take a guy that was so productive and then to so utterly ignore whatever problems he had that summer and that spring is fireable. I mean, the guys got fired. But, <laughs> you know, to, when, when there was a Carlos conversation with fans, well, you know, Carlos has to be more responsible for himself. No, no. Y you have an asset. You need to grow and cultivate this asset. You need to make sure that you trim the leaves a little bit and give it some water <laughs> and let it out in the sun and make sure it continues to grow. And they just, like, stepped on it over yeah. and over without caring. Well, I mean, didn't Dallas with Des Bryant, he had issues, like, he had a bodyguard and a security guard that was like, you have a curfew. Yeah. Like, like take care of him. Like, that's what you're getting. Josh like, Hamilton, like, you know. Yeah. Take care of the guy, and it was... Push him over the yeah. edge and say, well, you got to get better. It was it, just it, a fifth you. And it was just a fifth round pick, too. That was the other. I don't know. I don't think the Bills ever made this argument. But the other one from fans was, oh, it was a fifth round pick. They got a good year out of them. They're good. Are you kidding? He, he, you he had could. something here yeah. and you just tossed in the garbage can. Yep. Yeah. And, and I also wonder, and, and this could be total conjecture and no link to this, but, you know, he suffers a concussion yeah. in his rookie season. And though he was still productive after that concussion, I believe in the Giants game, um, you know, it, it wasn't the same for Carlos Williams. Mm -hmm. And. I'm not expecting him to score a touchdown every game like he did the first four or five games of his career. But I wonder, you know, concussions are a scary thing, a mysterious thing. that We don't know the impact that they have on these guys. Could it have lingered into the offseason to the fact where, you know, I don't want to work out or maybe it zaps his motivation. Maybe it's, sure. you know, hey, you know, I'll have that second slice of pizza or yeah, third or yeah. fourth, you know, like well, who knows? Uh, we had, I had a 
I, I was in the media scrum when Carlos talked to us in 2015 about his concussion. And it was a fascinating and scary conversation because Carlos Williams is not a dumb individual. He is pretty bright and understood what goes on and with the concussion. And he doesn't hold things back either. No, he doesn't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and he didn't have a problem with telling us all the things he had to do. And when you get a concussion, I don't know if everybody realizes this, it is one of the more scary and more uncomfortable things to go through. You have to pretty much lie in a dark room with no TV, no music, no anything for days on end. You can't get up, you can't go anywhere. And he described this with uh, the amount of lucidity and clearness that you would you know, do with me and you talking about what we had for lunch that day. But then he followed up with, Oh yeah, I'm gonna keep playing football. Oh yeah, I'm gonna keep doing everything the same way I did it. And I remember thinking in this scrum, like, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> you are a, a talented, um, smart guy who really has no idea how to make the best uses of the good things you do. You're just gonna continue to run literally headfirst into this wall and hope it all works out. So, you know, even in the middle of 2015, before you suspended, before you learned all these other things, I was actively scared for the guys, not just football future in general. Like I said, and you talk about that asset. You need two running backs, it seems like, in the NFL nowadays. Yeah. You, you need a change of pace, whether, like I said, and with McCoy's injury history as well, Carlos, a fifth-round pick, which seemed ended up seeming like a steal, yeah. and you just bang his head against the wall. He's, you know, get better. You it on your own. And mm. again, it, it's just, you see, it was the comment. It was there, and it was yeah. gone, yeah. and you sat there and were like, oh, man. What, what could have been? Yeah, I mean, Carlos ends up with the Pittsburgh Steelers and it doesn't get better for him. Nope. You know, he eats himself basically out of the league. And My we, first story at training camp, we talked about his diet. My first day covering the job, <laughs> talked about his diet. I was like, man, oh, he's going to get it together. He's going to get eight touchdowns, eight, nine touchdowns his rookie year. Oh, this is a great guy. He's, this is going to be a, a nice combo. Nope. Didn't even make it. <laughs> didn't, didn't make it. Friday, August 5th, two days before your first day at News 8. Um, the, the way that... Training camp practices, go training camp has already started. It's been uh, underway for about a week at this point. Is that uh, you can shoot with your camera the first few sessions, the first few um, uh, drills during training camp, and then cameras down because they're going through the playbook. There are hundreds and thousands of people watching. Anyone could be from another team. But anyway, yeah, it, exactly. But no, okay, fine. The media can't shoot the rest of uh, practice at training camp. And I was happening to be talking to a friend of Down and Drought, Mark Ludwizak. And um, we were, I, I can't even remember what we were talking about, probably talking about soccer, because that's what we do. <laughs> and uh, then all of a sudden, Reggie Ragland, their second round pick, hops off the field, and then he's in trainer's arms, and then he's just gone. And then we're watching, like, did you see it? I didn't, I, what happened? And then it turns out, I just happened to be sending a snap to my wife at that time, which was just like, hey, just another day at Bill's training camp. And I happened to have video mm -hmm. of Reggie Ragland tearing his ACL, and, and uh, PSC, Pagula Sports Entertainment, they've released video of the actual injury itself that's much better shot than mine because that was their intention was shooting this play. And it happens on a non-contact play. He's just Make running after. Yep. He makes a move, kind of turns a little bit, and the next thing you know, he's down on the ground, you know, holding his knee. It was a huge blow because, as we have pointed out, the Bills had no money to sign free agents. So, and I was telling people this from the start of the 2016 offseason. The Bills in 2016... We're going to be the exact same team in 2015 that went 8-8 eight and eight plus yeah. a draft class. Well, now they were the exact same team that they were 8-8 eight and eight the year before with a draft class that didn't include your first or second round pick for the most part. How are they going to get better? How yeah. is that team yeah. going to improve two wins and make the playoffs? And again, the, the injury is so funny because even for the fans, you can't watch everything because there's offense over here, there's defense over there. You're looking one way. And how many times does it happen? Even when you're, even when you're able to shoot stuff, you're like, wait, what was that? Yeah. Wait, what, what, what yeah. happened? Yeah. And all of a sudden, some guy disappears, and then you find out later the fact of, oh, by the way, ACL. Yeah. Or, or Kevin Cobb <laughs> slipped on a rubber mat. And like, yeah, no, I didn't see that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so two days later, Sunday, August 7th, your first day at News 8, Dan. That's it. Um, walking into this sports department, walking into Rochester, and uh, – Covering this football team, what were your thoughts as you immediately began training camp? He said something about being shrouded in greatness and yeah, that was worthy, something like that. Yeah. I think. Just, just, just some like, handsome boys yeah, in yeah, this department. Yeah. Well, I mean, sure, yeah. just like everybody listening to the, the podcast, it's I get to cover a pro team. Like this, this is so cool. I grew up here and all, and all that stuff. So it was cool to to go from being in little old Elmira, nothing against Elmira, but it's Elmira, and getting to come here and, and get to cover a pro team on a daily basis. It was amazing, and then to, to quickly, like I said, you t I talked to Carlos Williams and Nikel Roby Coleman. 
First two stories, <laughs> neither of them are here my second year. Yeah, that was right, quick. Geez. Welcome to the business. Yeah, so the Bills, now they have to scramble to add depth to their linebacking core because they don't have Raglan, and Lawson's not there as well. So they bring in Brandon Spikes, and he's going to compete along with Lorenzo Alexander and Zach Brown, which when you think about the 2016 season, it's kind of funny that, like, oh, there's a three-way battle to, to be <laughs> for the linebacking job between Alexander, uh, Brown, and Spikes. Monday, August 8th. Some good news for the Bills. They could use some good news. Sammy Watkins returns to training camp. He's passed his physical, as have Kyle Williams. He has suffered a knee injury in 2015. Marcel Darius is activated, too. But then uh, the bad news returns for the Buffalo Bills just a couple days later on Thursday, August 11th. Aaron Williams collides with Dez Lewis and suffers a concussion. Aaron Williams uh, back after that scary neck injury in 2015 that he suffered against the New England Patriots. And I remember when that collision happened, I didn't have a good line of sight at it. I can't remember who I was there. I can't remember if I was, I was with too. you. Yeah, okay. there, yeah. yeah um, and uh, I couldn't see, I didn't see Aaron, but you heard it. Mm -hmm. And then you heard the silence from the whole Grounding Stadium at St. John Fisher. Um, and then, oh no, it's Aaron Williams. That was, the, it was like <laughs> silence, then it's Aaron. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you run, you grab your camera, and you get him coming off the field. And I just remember being like, that may be the last time you see Aaron Williams on a football field. The sad part about it for me was the inner squad scrimmage had been two or three days before, and it was full tackle, you know, let's 100% football except for quarterbacks. And Aaron had made a couple pretty physical tackles, and we talked to him afterward, and he seemed giddy about it. Just, look, I've gotten through this. I've had my first couple hits. He had talked about the whole offseason that once you get that first real hit, that would be the real test for his neck. And now he had passed it. And not only passed it, but passed it with flying colors. And then three days later, to just have it all go away, he walked right by me off the field. You can see the look in his eyes, like, Again? Are yeah. you kidding? You know, but this was a concussion. It wasn't a neck injury. He obviously didn't know that right at that the time. Moment, right. But we're yeah. all thinking neck at the time because I mean, it was that especially injury. you talking to Carlos Williams then during the offseason. You know how scary these concussions are. I don't think the everyday fan maybe that gets to be in the locker, you know, besides us, get to be in the locker room and talk to these guys or see how isolated they are, get to know how scary these concussions are. I think it's almost like the the boogie monster. Like, oh, it's just concussions. Oh, I had concussions when I was playing football back in mm -hmm. 1980 or whatever. It's like these are scary things, yeah. and now you have a player who's had them before or a neck injury. Even that, I'm just saying, you, you go and you go, oh, like you said, yeah. is he gonna be back? Have you guys ever talked to someone after they've suffered a concussion? My brother had a concussion. He played college football, and he said instantly it was on a kickoff play. He got hit and looked at his buddy and goes, "I can't believe we have striped and polka dot pants." And his buddy went. You need to see a trainer. And he said he couldn't focus in school. It was the same thing like you were saying. Mm. Scary stuff, can't focus at all. I only had minor concussions from hockey, but it was still like, don't fall asleep. Don't fall asleep. Yeah. A a a and really, it's, there's no timetable for this stuff. There's yeah. no, no to say, okay, in a week, you're back. Yeah. You have no it's idea. Not, it's, not a, it's not a sprain. It's not a break. It's, mm. it's, it's something so much scarier than that. I remember in 2013, uh, the, the Bills played the Patriots in Foxborough, and Fred Jackson suffered a concussion in that game. And in just kind of a rare moment in the locker room afterward, Fred Jackson was there. And, you know, he got taken off the field with trainers, and you just thought, like, wow, kind of like Fred Jackson didn't play the rest of the game, and, like, here he is. I kind of thought this was maybe a bit more serious. And I went over to him, and I just said, you know, hey, Fred, you have a minute? Just, I think he fumbled on the play as well. Um, and he just kind of, like, looked over with this, like, glazed look as if, like, there wasn't a person there. And I went like, oh my God. And then, you know, one of the Bills PR staff was like, oh no, he's not talking, he's not talking. And you just like, geez, this is hours later mm -hmm. and Fred Jackson is acting like another human, like isn't there, though he's like staring at him. Mm -hmm. It was uh, very, you know, uneasy, disconcerting to, mm -hmm. to see that. And now here's Aaron Williams going through one after such a scary neck injury the year prior. The really sad part about it is not 10, 15 years ago, we all would have laughed at that story. You know, that, that wouldn't yeah. be a scary story. That'd be funny. Like, oh, he got his bell rung. Didn't even know you were there. I mean, you know? earlier yeah. in down in drought, Drew Bledsoe suffers a high-low hit yeah. against the New York Giants. He says, like, oh, I got my bell rung. And, like, there are laughs about yeah. it. That, mm. Like, that's amazing. Mm. And, you know, and now 12, 13, 14 years ago after that play, you know, concussions are taken much more seriously uh, than they were in the early 2000s. Well, moving forward, Friday, August 12th, the Bills have a quarterback that has one year left on his contract. Oh, no, he now has... Six years on his contract because Tyrod Taylor signs a six-year, $90 million extension. I remember people going like, oh, my God, the Bills gave Tyrod Taylor that much money? Wait, wait, not so fast. Yeah. It's, it's really like a one-year, $9 million contract. And if he turns into the next Russell Wilson, 
then yeah, it's six years, 90 million, but there's no way he's seen this money. I thought it was a great deal. I thought Doug Whaley had done one of the, I yeah. really liked it because it gave the Bills an opportunity to say, okay, if you're terrible in year two, they could have cut him with no penalty. And, it, and if they liked him, they'd keep him on for two more years, but it wasn't even the full five years. It was just going to be two and then you could re-up after that. So there were so many levels of opportunities where the Bills could have gotten out of the deal. The only thing that really would have hosed the Bills if he kind of had a, a middle of the road, we're not quite sure season, which is what he ended up having. Um, <laughs> it's but funny how that right. works. But then as it turned out, he ended up taking a renegotiation last spring anyway. So, yeah. it, you know, it really was one of Doug Whaley's better moves. Absolutely. And you're going, okay, well, what's in it for Tyrod? Exactly. It, it, was, yeah. it was pretty much a one-year deal. Like, it was the $6 million up front. Yeah. That's what he that got. It. Every year you have something to prove. Um, this is a competition-driven league, of course. Um, so it's not like NBA where everything is guaranteed. Um, you can get cut at any given time. So anytime you step on that field, there's something to prove, and that's been my mindset. Every time I step on the practice field, there's something for, for me to prove, and I'm going to continue to keep showing that every time I lace my cleats up. So uh, moving forward, oh, and there's also in the Tyrod contract a $27.5 million injury-only guarantee mm. for 2017. We'll get to that later, yeah. That mm. looms over mm. the rest of mm. this season. Uh, Saturday, August 13, Ralph Wilson Stadium is now called New Era Field. Thought that was kind of neat that mm -hmm. like oh hey Ralph Wilson Stadium is they are moving forward they're calling it the cap no one is going to call it the cap no one has yeah. it's a stupid nickname Tuesday August 16th Marcel Darius suspended four games for violating the substance abuse policy he says the next day that he missed a drug test we've talked about Darius's off the field incidents for the last couple episodes of down and drought and really we're doing this again Marcel yeah I'm going to just skip it you know he's he's not done a lot of things correctly this was another one he didn't do correctly whatever his excuse is fine you know, and, and we all have talked about the things that have happened in his life, and they're absolutely terrible, and there's sympathy from everyone, but at some point, you got to figure it out for yourself. I, I, I just like it. He didn't fail it. He yeah. missed it. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. I would have passed it. If I would have been there, I would have passed it. Well, we'll never know. Yeah, no, we will never know. And then uh, Saturday, August 20th, the Bills open the preseason. Uh, you and I were at this one, Dan. We, we were driving up. We were driving to New Era Field, no longer Ralph Wilson That's Stadium. Right. Uh, though it was still Ralph Wilson Stadium for this game, which is kind of strange. Correct. Because this was the last game as Ralph like Wilson shoot, Stadium. It was like shoot logos. Yeah, <laughs> get, get logos of, of Ralph Wilson Stadium. So uh, as we are driving to One Bills Drive, to Orchard Park, Amazing. the Bills announced that Carlos Williams has been released. This happening two hours before kickoff. Then Marcel Darius announces he is entering rehab. Um, Wow. Surprises on game day typically happen during the game, but these are the 2016 Buffalo Bills. In the lead up to kickoff, the Bills announcing they've released running back Carlos Williams. Then Marcel Darius announced he will enter a rehab facility. After the game, all the talk was about the two guys not on the sideline or the Buffalo Bills. Yeah, there was a lot that went on from the time that we got to the stadium today until we kicked off. Um, yeah, big, big news and, uh, you know, hope, uh, hope both of them learn from all this and, and come out as better people. When I came in, they told me about it, and I was shocked. Um, but kind of, I kind of see Los as a younger brother, so, you know, I was obviously uh, just one of those things, you know what I mean? This is a business, and you got to do your part. And, uh, you know, like I said, this is going to be a learning experience for him. Well, as somebody that spends a lot of time with him, has been around him a lot, I care more about him than I do his football career. Right. So I want to see him be better. And if this is the step that him and um, Terry and Kim thought that he needed to take, and, and this is going to you know, work out in the long run better for him, then so be it. We're driving up there, and it's like, all right, Dan, like, this is how it works. Yeah, this, this is, is this Dan's is, first preseason This is how it game. works, all right? You know, we're going we're gonna to do a story, and then you're going to do a story, and this is, this is how it's going to go. I remember just being like, and I remember there was the, the talk about who's going to be the third running back. Was it going to be this Gilsey guy or Wilder? And, you know, Carlos Williams will get his act together. He, you know, he'll serve his penalty, but he's, he was a great guy. And it was like, oops, he won't get his act together. <laughs> he's not there he anymore. Gone. And it's like, it's like, okay, like, all right, we got one story now. And, like, literally, again, it was like 15 minutes later, it's like Darius entering rehab. And I was on the field shooting the game. Yeah. And I was Whaley, up in the locker room right, or in the press box. Didn't Whaley appear? Yeah, Whaley comes out and uh, talked for about a minute and a half, two minutes, and answered a couple questions. You just had your phone. Yeah, I mean, you had the camera, yeah. so I just pulled my phone out and just was, okay, try not to, like, hit the microphone or anything because we can use this later. And this is a performance-based business. And the release of Carlos Williams was strictly performance-based. He came in behind the eight ball and never caught up, and there was other guys on the roster that moved ahead of him. So in light of that, we thought, why hold on to him? Why don't we give him a chance to maybe find another job out there in the league? We weren't going to hold on to him to then knowing he wasn't going to make the team. He's family, and we're being supportive of him in this step. 
uh, in his life. And uh, we won't, I told you guys we wouldn't give up on him. And uh, again, we wholeheartedly support this effort. You know, preseason time, hold your preseason, arms yeah, preseason games really don't mean a whole lot. This one really didn't mean anything because two huge storylines happened before kickoff. And you're trying to prepare, and Prescott's like, this is how we're going to do it, and this is how you work it, and like this. <laughs> Showing you the ropes. Two, yeah, and <laughs> two hours before kickoff, the story was set. They could have, yeah. it could have been a 0-0 tie in the preseason mm -hmm. game. It wouldn't have mattered, or 120. It didn't <laughs> matter. There was the storylines. Darius going to rehab, no more Carlos Williams. Yep. September 9th, right on the eve of the season, Sean Trail Henderson suspended four games for violating the substance abuse policy. He had parts of his intestines removed, multiple surgeries due to Crohn's disease, and one of the ways to treat Crohn's disease is through marijuana use. It, it mm. numbs the effects and fights the symptoms of Crohn's disease. Um, you know, Thad, you and I, we've talked to Sean Trail throughout his career, and you know, he's a kind of a timid guy around the media, mm. and you know, who knows what you know guys are like really off the field, but. It felt like the league and the Bills almost to an extent as well really didn't do well for Chantrell Henderson. The, the, there's another discussion that we need to not have in this forum about yeah. whether or not marijuana use should be allowed in the NFL, if not just in general, but certainly in a situation like this. The league's policy right now is a blanket. It's just, you know, no marijuana and a story. And unfortunately, Chantrell is going to be, you know, up a creek in that situation. And I feel bad for him because, like you said, he's a timid guy who feels like he's been dealt a bad hand. I mean, Crohn's disease is a pretty terrible hand to begin with, but also trying to play football with it and having the ability to do so and not having the will to avoid marijuana on your own anyway. There's so many things that are, are hurting him. Some are his fault, some are not. It's just a bad, bad deal that you wish someone could step in, whether it's Chantrell or the NFL or yeah. the Bills, if someone could just, let, let's do something to benefit this guy. And again, yeah. Sean Trell bears some responsibility in this too. It's a black and white issue. That's what the NFL says. Yeah. But, it, but you wish that in Sean Trell's case, there was that gray area. It's a league disciplinary, you know, disciplinary issue. And really, I'm, you know, we can't comment on it. And, and I think if you want further information ab about this, I think you should just uh, contact the league. You, you saw how much weight this guy lost, how he worked so hard to come back. His teammates were just talking him up like, this is great to see him back. And he talks about his diet, everything that he had to cut out and, and to gain the weight back and, and the, what he went through. And you're like, come on, NFL. Yeah, cover yeah. break. Please, yeah. Yeah. Like, come on. Well, we've gotten through the offseason of 2016. There were a lot of things that happened that year. We finally get to week one, September 11th in Baltimore, and the Bills offense stinks out the joint. You guys were both there down in, uh, in Baltimore. Your thoughts as the Bills dropped the season opener 13-6 to to the Ravens. I'll sum it up in one sentence. During the third quarter, me and the guys on the sideline had discussions about whether this game was worse than Cleveland 6-3. That's, that's what it was. It was that bad a game. I was excited. It was my first game. <laughs> <laughs> so I was more blown away being at the press box. Like, this is so cool. But at the same time, I was like, this offense has problems. Uh -huh. it, because it just didn't seem like, you know, Sammy Watkins wasn't really, didn't, he didn't seem explosive and, and so on and so forth. And we, we quickly find out why. But you just went there and said, where's this team going to score? Because nobody thought that highly of Baltimore. And you kind of knew what the Ravens were going to give you. And the, what was the Bills? He scored six points. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the only explosive play, Joe Flacco to Mike Wallace for a 66-yard touchdown. Mike Wallace. That yeah. was, oh, man. He burned Duke Williams on that one. The Bills had nine drives in this game. Two of them had more than six plays. Unbelievable. So wow. bad. Yeah, it felt Thir like that. 13 to 6. <laughs> it was a bad day. It really was. We didn't get nothing really established. We probably had one long drive, I and mean, that was really it. Just by looking at yourself sometimes isn't it. You, I, I, and probably one of the only coaches that'll give credit to the opponent because they deserve it. And that defense played extremely well. They're well coached, and um, and they got after us. We knew it was going to be, you know, tough sledding. We knew it, but we thought we'd be able to make a few more plays than we did. In this particular game, 14 points would have won the game. So to look at it, and say seven points didn't do it. Of course, it didn't. Um, we got to be better in certain areas. Uh, Learn from it, got a quick turnaround, and, and get back on it uh, next week. Well, Monday, September 12th, the very next day, Manish Mehta, our dear friend from the New York Daily News, not really our friend. He's no. like a good guy. No, Maybe? he's not. No, nope. oh, nope. right. bad Sorry, guy. Sorry, Manish. Uh, says Sammy Watkins will be shut down for a few weeks with a foot injury. Jason Lock and four <laughs> of CBS Sports reports mm. that Watkins has an issue with screws in his foot. Pain management is what he needs to play through. Watkins says it's much ado about nothing. How close are you to being 100%, put it that way? Um, I don't know. Um, I, all I can tell you, I feel great. Um, I don't know if I'm around 100 or 95, whatever it is. I feel great. Um, I can go out there and compete at the highest level. I can make plays. So 
um, the biggest thing is just being smart and um, staying healthy throughout the whole season. Yeah, right. I had a Bill source tell me too that that was that, was, that he was going to be out for a while, along with the same same day those guys had it. So this was we're driving know, back. Yeah, we're driving back. <laughs> it's like. We got to switch. I got to get on my cell phone, yeah, and, and yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll drive for a little bit. You, you take care of this. And I just remember calling at the time my fiance and just being like, "You know, the Sammy Watkins guy. He's he's he, you know this 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 is this is a new story." And again, it's like, "Oh, it's Monday. They lost week one. Not a big deal." Just kidding. <laughs> it is a big deal. Sammy Watkins is really hurt. Well, see, it was a big deal too because we had talked about that season with Baltimore and then the Jets at home on a Thursday. We talked about the whole preseason of how 2016 could be up in flames five days into the year yeah. if they had lost both those games and. Didn't quite turn out that way, but it yeah. almost did. Yeah, yeah. It, it sure almost did. Uh, a couple days later, Thursday, September 15th, the Bills have their own their home opener in Week Two against the New York Jets on national television on CBS. There's some big plays in this game. Marquise Goodwin has an 84-yard touchdown. Greg Salas flips into the end zone for a 71-yard score. Nikel Roby Coleman, your best friend, 36-yard fumble recovery for a touchdown. But the rest of the Bills' offense wasn't very good, and Ryan Fitzpatrick throws for 374 <laughs> yards. Uh, Matt Forte has three rushing touchdowns, 100 yards on the ground. Watkins didn't play in the final two drives. Jets scored 37 points. The Bills scored 31 points. They're 0-2 to start the year. Bills were a bit unfortunate to catch the Jets here because virtually at any other point <laughs> of the year, the, I mean, the Jets quickly turned into a tire fire. That Buffalo was stopped if they had, you know, played them in week seven, week 12, whatever week it was. So to catch them week two, especially the home game, yep. you know, was unfortunate. That said, you know, this was the beginning of Ronald Darby having a whole year where he gets exposed. And the Bills offense, again, even though they scored all those points, did it on like four big plays. They were almost as bad as they were against Baltimore. Yeah, that, that tire fire was on fire today. <laughs> Fitz looked like, it was like yes. Tom Brady had a beard. It was, it was, it <laughs> yes, was it really was. Yeah. And you're sitting there, you're like, ah, oh, it's, it's, it's Fitz. And you find out the rest of the season, Fitz is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> but you're sitting there like, oh my gosh, like, the Jets aren't supposed to be able to do this. And you're like, well, the, but you know, the often scored a couple of times. All right, for, for the Bills, positive side. Honestly, nine times out of 10, I'll take our matchups. Um, today, those guys, they made all the plays. Marshall, Decker, 81, they made all the plays. They went out there, they got the ball, they made the catches. Fitz did an amazing job. Um, we tip our hat to them. They played a great game today. And then we get to Friday. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is such a stupid team. Because because we had to tape the show. Yeah. So it was a long. Was the media that day? When was that so Tuesday? We, yeah. to, to, so all right, to, we'll give the whole story. To take everybody behind the curtain, we do a weekly show called Inside the Buffalo Blitz, but it's it's usually taped Thursday, air Sunday, because we had a Thursday game. We had a live show on Thursday night that we had to prep for, using mainly stuff we got from Wednesday. A little bit from Monday. So we do, we, yeah. Yeah. so Wednesday we go up to Buffalo, we do all our work, we turn it into a half hour show, at least the parts of it. We do a live half hour show, seven o'clock on Thursday, but we still have to fill that Sunday slot. So the Sunday show becomes a recap show. That means yep. when we come back on Thursday, we had to get everything ready to tape the Sunday show on, on Friday, Friday morning. That's right. Oh God. We were there until I five in the morning. Five, yeah, we, yeah. yeah I forgot about that. Yeah, that's right. And yeah, I shot that jet game. And we both went to sleep for just like 20 minutes. Yeah. Like, I'm just going to put my head down. Yeah, I, re <laughs> I can't down. remember. I, I, think, I think maybe you did the six o'clock show that night and then we did Football Frenzy that Friday. Um, and just like fumes of fumes, like yeah. just nothing yeah. left. So tired. Well, because this was this was the first Friday of a few Fridays where the Bills Drop some news. That's usually yeah. not a Bills thing to do during the season. The big news happens typically Wednesday or pregame. Fridays tend to be quiet days. Well, Greg Roman gets the boot as offensive coordinator a day after scoring 31 points, though. Seven of that came from defense, and the offense only did it on a handful of plays. Anthony Lynn promoted from running backs coach to offensive coordinator. Uh, Greg Roman was the highest paid offensive coordinator in the league, and now he is on the street. Before we talk about the take, just to continue the, the story of our day, Amazing. that we were going to do the show, and I think I was going to book out and be done for the weekend, yeah. and you guys were going to handle the 6 and the 11. But when Greg Roman gets fired, then I have to go up to Buffalo because that becomes the story of the day. So I went to Buffalo, you know, back again, oh, hours after the game. Sucks. I can't even yeah. remember now. I know. I think I did it, but I did it live from yeah. there. Oh, okay. So, but the thing with Greg Roman, this was a simple scapegoat. As we said, the worry was the Bills season could disintegrate in five days. Well, it had happened, and now you needed somebody to blame. Rex runs the defense, so he can't fire himself. He can't fire anybody from that side of the ball. He's can't fire his brother. His brother, right. So the only guy left to fire is Greg Roman. And it, it helped that Anthony Lynn, who was viewed league-wide as an up-and-comer, was there to replace him. You know, I wonder if, if they had not had somebody there, would that still have happened? Probably. But Lynn made it easier, for sure. I feel like when I read media reports, it feels like a lot more crisis than we feel within the building. 
Um, I read like eight different, you know, sitting around the couch watching game yesterday, I read like eight different reports of what went down Friday. Um, you know, only we know the truth. People can say whatever they want. It's a beautiful country. You can say exactly what you want. Do I believe some of the reports that are out there? Some are ridiculous, you know, but that's okay, and, and I understand it comes with it. It comes to the territory. When you're 0-2... Distractions are the things that you let distract you. You know, I mean, it's, oh, well, the, you know, the last month has been distracting. Well, you can go all the way back to the off-season and the off-season before that. You know, the only distraction is the ones you, that you let in. Unbelievable. They get gashed by Ryan Fitzpatrick, and you can the offensive coordinator. <laughs> and again, it's they, just like beautiful. Like you said, it, it's just yeah. the most beautiful scapegoat where you just went... Wait, what? Yeah. Like you went, what, what? Yeah, and I remember the thought at the time was, well, when the Bills fire Rex Ryan, they'd replace him with Greg Roman. Well, <laughs> yeah. Rex gets ahead of that by canning exactly. Greg Roman. Exactly. Yeah. And there was talk that Greg Roman would have been the head coach if Rex hadn't taken the job two years ago. Yeah, yeah he was a candidate. He had yeah. been interviewed by the, by the Pagoulas for the job that Rex would later fill. Uh, Saturday, September 24th, Sammy Watkins tweets that he's ready to go, that he is ready to play in week number three. Sunday, September 25th, the very next day, the Bills make Watkins inactive mm. for week three against the Arizona Cardinals. And we won't talk about this game much because not really a whole lot happened in it. Aaron Williams returns a botched snap on a field goal, 53 yards for a touchdown. Sean McCoy is a pair of touchdowns. Bills win 33-18. They get in the win column finally. Impressive win. You know, they look good. You, you know, everybody wasn't too – this was, again, we know who the Bills are. Sure, you won today, yeah. but we know who you are already. Yeah. I just remember – there before the game, I shot that game and just being like, they're going to lose by 100, right? They're going to lose by 100. And, <laughs> and the Cardinals, we all thought were good. Yeah, that's right. Cardinals, yeah, yeah. Oh, these are going to be these juggernauts, and like the Bills are just, oh, they're licking their wounds. <laughs> they're going to be so bad. It's like, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. 2 1. Oh, hey, not, hey, this is, we're 1 and 2. It's okay. Yeah. It's, it's all right. We're all right. There were multiple conversations in the sideline pregame about how, so what's the score going to be? 15 to nothing? It was oh, 16 to nothing? Yeah, we we all yeah. had that conversation. Yeah, Carson Palmer picked up four times, twice by Stephon Gilmore. I don't know if anybody needed a win worse than we did. Just uh, feel very fortunate to get one. We, we know what everybody thought of our football team, and we knew that we were a better football team than that. We showed up today. Um, you know, again, I, I, I tip my hat to the coaches. I think they did an unbelievable job. Uh, so it, it was great to see. But it was great to see that all the hard work, all that preparation that we put in, you know, uh, actually meant something. Now it's Patriots week for the Buffalo Bills, and uh, a couple days before the start of that game in week four against the Pats, Rex Ryan pranks Julian Edelman. Dan, you and I were both there for that, uh, that yes. press conference as uh, our conference call for Julian Edelman as Rex waiting on the, side of the on the side of the stage like, well, as soon as that's done, I'm, I'm going to talk at the podium. And then uh, hmm, light bulb goes off over his head. I'm going to have a little bit of fun. It helps everyone out. Uh, Julian, this is uh, Walt Patalski from the Buffalo News. Uh, are you playing quarterback this week? Huh? Are you playing quarterback this week? <laughs> Walt, I'm going to do whatever the coach is asking me to, to do, so you can ask coach that one. All right, Julian, I will, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and the conference call phone is right next to the podium. You're like, that's going to be awkward. I just remember being like, Prescott again was like, just be by the camera in case he comes over and does something stupid. And sure enough, <laughs> yeah, you yeah, no, I mean, it was, it was Dan be ready because Rex will be out and we want to get Rex. Yeah. I didn't think Rex was going to walk over to the, the, the telephone. Yeah. <laughs> he walks out and all the reporters are huddled over this one phone and you just see Rex and he's just like, <laughs> I'm going to do something I'm, great. I'm going to get him here. And you're just like, I'm going to get on Sports Center. You're like, you're like, oh, here we go. This is going to be incredible. <laughs> it, it was. And so, yeah, and we have the video of it. Um, but yeah, Rex Ryan got himself on Sports Center because he pretended to be Walt Patolsky uh, from the Buffalo News during Julian Edelman's conference call. It sure helps to break up the season, though. You know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> otherwise. Gives you headlines, gives you clicks. I mean, think if, if it's Sean McDermott doing that and it's a one and two team that we already know is dead, you know, they don't know they're dead, but we know they're dead. What kind of press conference is that going to be? That's going to be. I miss, I miss so, Rex already. Yeah. <laughs> I already miss Rex. It was just whether it was a Clemson, whether he was putting on plays of his son being the holder for Clemson. Oh, yeah, he did do that too. Just all these yeah. things that you just were like, well, have the camera ready for when he walks out. Because you don't, he can walk yeah. out in a Clemson Tiger costume. Yeah, and yes. you'd be like, this is amazing. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I remember being, because I happen to have the video of Rex in the Clemson helmet. I remember telling you, like, just make sure you have the camera pointed at the door. Yep when Rex comes out and who knows it you know more often than not it'll just be Rex but he may not one day <laughs> and we want to get that video and you know sure enough there he goes over to the to the telephone 
Well, on uh, Friday, September 30th, the Bills shut down Sammy Watkins. So here's the second straight Friday where we're in Rochester. Like, really, Bills, you couldn't have one quiet Friday <laughs> a week later. Uh, Sammy Watkins can return in eight weeks. But the guy that you invested so much in, who already has an injury history, is now going to miss half the season. It just was a, you know, another thing to add on to the litany of things that have gone wrong for Sammy Watkins. And, you know, this was, you go back to Shaq Lawson and how poorly the Bills handled the press conference. There was a part of that where, does their medical staff really know what they're doing? Mm -hmm. Because the GM of the team came out after he was drafted and said, he's fine, no surgery. And, the and guy, our staff cleared him. Exactly. That was the other part of it. And then a month later, he's under the knife. Well, Sammy Watkins, after there's a report following week one that he should be shut down for a while, plays in week two, and then is shut down for a while, maybe longer than he would have been if he had sat down earlier. So not only is this a Rex and a Sammy thing, it's do the Bills have doctors that know what the hell they're doing? <laughs> it's the same old Sammy saga. Leaks coming out left and right. That would seem kind of be the theme mm -hmm. of this year and just wondering, you know, is this guy going to be that one that just never played? It was just injuries were, were hampering him. That, that is a question with him right now. That, yeah. that he, he could be the, yeah, lingers the, to today. the first round talent that just never realizes his potential because he can't be on the field. Week four, the Bills go on the road to take on the New England Patriots. And Thad, you and I were in Foxborough. And if you've ever been to a Patriots game and uh, won with Tom Brady at quarterback, you know that when uh, they are in warm ups before the game starts, they'll come out, Tom Brady will come out the tunnel and will run the length of the field to the other end zone. And he'll throw his arms up and he'll scream and shout, get the fans all up and into it. The music's blasting because they know when Tom Brady's coming up. Everybody knows when TB12 walks onto the field. And I was shooting this game for us at News 8, and I thought, I wonder if Jacoby Brissett, who's going to start this game, if he's going to do the same thing. I didn't know. And uh, so I was, you know, on the field pregame getting shots of different guys. And, and I see Jacoby Brissett running down the field and I go, oh, no, I'm not in position for, like, for when this moment's going to happen. So I run into that spot hoping I can get Brissett to go, yeah, and get the crowd all into it. And I miss it by five seconds. And just went, oh, well, that, you know, there are a million things to get in a football mm -hmm. game. And this thing that was in the back of my mind, I just wasn't at the front of my mind uh, when it took place. So I'm getting Jacoby Brissett running the other end of the field. And here comes Robert Blanton. He just comes up and just gives him a shove. <laughs> and I went, oh! And then here comes Aaron Williams and then Malcolm Mitchell. And then a whole bunch of Patriots and Bills start pushing and shoving. A couple punches are thrown. And wow, who would have thought in a week four game against the Tom Brady list Patriots, we'd have a fight pregame, all because Jacoby Brissett and Malcolm Mitchell ran across the field. Robert Blanton thought they were getting in the way of defensive back drills, which can be a danger because D-backs, when they warm up, as they often do in a game, have to practice backpedaling and get used to it. And if you're in the wrong spot, you can get them hurt. But Jacoby Brissett has played in one or two or 85 games in his career. He, I'm assuming, has an understanding of where to run. And I, yeah, you might have a better look at this than I did. I didn't it's think, near the white. It's basically at the sideline. I, well, the guys practice on the sideline. They practice everywhere. So the, the white necessarily doesn't say yay or nay on this. It didn't seem like he was really that close to where it was a danger. No. To continue the discussion, if it's Tom Brady running the exact same exactly. footprints, which he does, nobody would have touched exactly. him. So this was a, a Bills thing. And I think that, you know, the Bills had certainly had an eventful, to say the least, first three weeks. So they were probably chomping at the bit to get at this Patriots team, even without Tom Brady. Mm -hmm. But it was it was dumb in a thousand ways, which when it comes to football fights, is pretty much how you describe most of it. It actually crunk us up because we like we came we came out like you know very re reserved like we always do you know calm but to, uh, today when he did that you know it, it kind of put a fire up on the under, underneath us and um, we came out there with some fire and was like no we ain't gonna let nobody disrespect us no matter where we at we're warming up as uh, you know doing our normal DB routine we're running down there and two guys are, are running through two Patriot guys are running through our DB drill you can hurt somebody because right. we're DBs we're backpedaling we don't see that so I'm like hey you know don't run through our drill it's disrespectful don't run through our drill but they come back and they run through our drill again regardless of what they want to say regardless of how they want to put it it was very much disrespectful you don't just go run into another team's drill while they're warming up it just doesn't happen they feel like they want to do that so cool it didn't bother me none the brady list patriots though they got a chance like hey yeah. like, okay it's it's Brissett, possibly garoppolo or possibly edelman yeah. you're like hey it, it, like those it, odds hey, if you go two and two you thought they would have been two and two but you thought they would have won the baltimore and the jets and you would have thought they lost to the cardinals and the patriots they're like all right we'll take this coin flip and then the fight happens beforehand and you're like Oh, they really want this game. They <laughs> really want this and it, might have, and it might have been the Bills trying to get into yeah. Jacoby Brissett's head. You know, yeah, which, for sure. Yeah. And it worked. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was his first NFL start. And, uh, yeah, it, 
It was an ugly game. Mm. LaShawn McCoy scores the touchdown uh, as a nice pass uh, reception from, from Tyrod Taylor, but the Bills' offense really does nothing. They, they go right game. down the field in the first draft yeah. yep. for a touchdown, score a nice field goal after that, and then... After. Yeah, and Brissett struggled too. Three sacks, mm -hmm. two fumbles, one of them lost. Dan Carpenter has to kick four field goals in this mm -hmm. game. Hits three of them. But the Bills win 16 to nothing. The first time the Patriots have been shut out at home since 1993. And that only happened because on the very first play of the game, I had forgotten something at the car. So I missed like the first three, four plays. So I'm running out to the parking lot to get the car, and I hear the stadium go nuts. And I thought, oh, I forgot did, about this. Did they, did they run the kickoff back for a touchdown? I didn't know what happened. So I come back in, and I'm expecting to see the Patriots either 7-0 or 3-0. Like they they got to have points on the board. And I come back in, and, and I see no score. I'm like, what happened? And it's like first and 20 from their own 15. Well, I got in, I got in by the time the Bills hit the ball. So I had no idea what oh, happened okay. the whole drive. But I come back in and realize that they had hit on some sort of like underneath play that Edelman ran all the way down to the one. It came back on a hold. Came back. If, if, That's right. If there's yeah. no holding on that play, do the Bills even win that game? You yeah. know, because the Bills probably up 7-0, yeah. and then we go from there. Brissett also has a fumble in the red zone yep. later in that game, too, yeah. where you know, okay, he fumbled the ball, so that happened. But if he hadn't, you know, yeah. who knows? Perhaps the Bills don't even win that game uh, that Tom Brady uh, was not the quarterback for. God, it feels good to finally win here. Been close about six times. Finally won one. was great. I mean, there have been several times that we got beat. I, I get the record. Everybody knows my record. Thought we had a chance in about half those things. But they did a great job. They'd always outcoach us. And today we, uh, you know, like I say, they had a player out, guys. They had a player out. And... We had our team here. Monday, October 3rd, Marcel Darius returns from suspension after the four-game absence. And then a couple days later on that Friday. So another Friday at the start of the season, Marcel Darius tweaks his hamstring. He can't even get into week five mm. because he's now injured his hamstring uh, going into the start uh, of that Rams game that would uh, be coming up the following Sunday. So you guys were out there in L.A. for that week five game. Uh, an another weird game has a pick six in this one. Tyrod Taylor lines up behind Richie Incognito for one play. The ball goes over his head. Then a play later, he converts a third and 19 on his legs. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the Bills sack uh, Case Keenum four times, pick him off twice. The Bills win 30 to 19, and now they've won three straight. They're over 500. It was six, either 16, I think it was 19 19 for a long time. Yeah. And on the field, my thought was the Bills are not going to win this game because they will not score another point. They might get out of it with a tie, they weren't going to <laughs> score again. If it wasn't for Nicole Roby Coleman running the pick back for a touchdown, they would not have. I was convinced they were not going to score again. And it was just like one of those things like, I mean, okay, they won. Like, okay, but it was like it's the Rams. It's Case Keenum. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. all right. So that, but like, I believe Lorenzo Alexander had like four sacks in that yep. game. Like, yeah. he was a monster. Yeah, he started to take off, and you're like, wow, this guy is. Who is, like, what is yeah. this, this journeyman guy? The yeah. legend of Lorenzo Alexander began there, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and this coming after Zach Brown had a million sacks against the Patriots mm -hmm. in week four, you thought, like, wow, Doug Whaley, like, hit big yes, did. on these linebackers yeah. that, you know, we kind of never even heard of, mm -hmm. and now they're having big contributions early in 2016. Week six, the San Francisco 49ers, the team of my youth, comes to Orchard Park, along with Colin Kaepernick, and uh, yeah, it was booed throughout, a lot of USA chants, kind of on the verge of uncomfortable in there, mm -hmm. yeah, but... Uh, the Bills thumped the 49ers any way you look at it. 45-16, outscored them 28-3 in the second half. Now they're 4-2. Now they've beaten up on Carson Palmer, who's a million years old, Case Keenum, Jacoby Brissett, and, you know, whatever you think of Colin Kaepernick, like at the end of whatever run he He was has. better at the end of the year, but at that point yeah, he was not exactly. very good. Yeah. So I, I just remember, you know, as we've said, 4-2, and two, but we know that they are. They're not a very good team. They're just beating up on bad quarterbacks. We talked about how the, the next week they're going to play Miami on the road. That was the game where, all right, if you win that game, a road division game, 5-2, and two, now we can start talking about maybe the Bills have a legit chance because those, those first four wins, like you said, you could nitpick all of them and say this isn't the real Bills. Right. And really the story of that San Fran game was Kaepernick pregame because the game was yeah. completely one-sided. And, and yeah, it was it, his first start, yeah, I believe. Yeah, it, yeah. It, was, it was anger. It was you know, um, venom. Um, it wasn't all against him. He had quite a few people who were cheering for him. Yep. Um, but it, it was the most unique pregame experience I've ever been to in 17 years coming to the The other major storyline of the day involved 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick. Though the crowd was definitely against him, it was clear after the game that several Bills have respect for the 49ers QB. Marquise Goodwin traded his jersey with Kaepernick. The two are fraternity brothers from different schools. Fights like these, a lot of the times you don't win them if you do them alone. I told him I support him 100%. It's, it's cool to have it, man. You know, this is part of history. Yeah, absolutely. We'll look back 20 years, 30 years from now and be like, you know, hey, this dude stood for something. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't fall for everything. He stood for something, stood his ground, and no matter how many times he got booed, no matter how the scrutiny that he faced, 
he still was resilient through that and had the heart and the courage to continue to do that. Though none of the bills have yet to kneel during the national anthem, several of them agree with Kaepernick's protest of police brutality and racial profiling. Bill's defensive end Leger Doosable said why he's doing it is the reason I think it's good. People have mixed emotions about it, but that's our right as Americans. We can do what we want to do. At New Era Field in Orchard Park, I'm Prescott Rossi with your Buffalo Blitz. Yeah, it was like I said, four and two, and you're like, hey, Anthony Lynn, this guy is a <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> Anthony Lynn. Four straight wins. Four, oh, yeah. they, they know what they're doing. Greg Roman was the problem. Yes. The, the only thing I do remember was that Tyrod Taylor started to run more. And that was the thing that Anthony Lynn said, we're going to let him be a quarterback. We're going to let him be athletic. We're going to let him do what he does best. And like you talked about that, that Rams play where he ran for it. You know, it was a 30-19. You're like, oh, now they figured it out. Tyrod's turned the corner. <laughs> He's winning games. This is it. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so another four and two going on the road to play uh, the Miami Dolphins, a team that they've had some success with in recent years. LaShawn McCoy uh, is limited because he tweaks his hamstring the week leading up to that game. Uh, in the second quarter, Aaron Williams suffers another injury, this time at the hands uh, of, Jarvis of Jarvis Landry on a blindside hit. And, uh, you know, I'm following the play as that happens. So I, I didn't see the hit when I was down on the field. You watch it later, you go, ooh, mm -hmm. that, that one looked bad. It was dirty. Yeah, no doubt. he it got fined for it, yeah, too. Yeah, deservedly so. That's a dirty play. It was unfortunate that it was Aaron who had the neck issue already. And that, you know, that very well would be the end of his career. But when it comes to Buffalo, that was the last time we saw him on the field in a Bills uniform. And it was it's unfortunate for a lot of reasons. The fact that it was dirty was certainly one of them. Yeah. And in this game also, uh, the Bills have a lead in this one, 17-6. Mm -hmm. Again, looking ugly the whole way, though. Yeah, thanks to a 67-yard touchdown pass to Marquise Goodwin. I was behind <laughs> the play. I just totally was like, oh, please don't be a touchdown. <laughs> ah, it's a touchdown. But, I, but I'm back going like, oh, this, you know, I'm cutting the show. I'm cutting my highlights. I'm like, this, all right, 17. Like, the Dolphins had done nothing on offense. Mm -hmm. And you're yep. like, all right, like, the Bills haven't done anything either, but they're just going to hold them out. The clock's, they're going to just run the <laughs> clock out. And it's like, oh, just kidding. Yeah, because uh, Jay Ajayi, a uh, star from Boise State. Boise State? Is that where he went? I don't think it matters. Eh, who cares? <laughs> uh, yeah, it runs for 214 yards. Just runs all over them. And, and uh, there are a couple games in this season, and there have been games like this in the drought, where you can sense, like, the sand slipping through your fingertips and just, like, Bills, just, like, get a first down, stop this, mm -hmm. take a deep breath, and we will finish this game out. And they just couldn't do it. That and they, just yep. could, they could not do it. Tannehill then has a 66-yard touchdown to Kenny Stills. The Bills led with five minutes to go, and they end up losing 28-25. Mm -hmm. And it was only a three-point game because Reggie Bush, that's right, Reggie Bush, haven't talked about, about him yet. Oh, that's right. He scored with, like, 14 seconds left. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was a game that was in your grasp, and you just totally gave it to Miami. Confirmed we were correct about the Bills at 0-2. Well, we tried everything, believe me. We were trying, you know, base defense. We were trying everything, putting our um, – you know, base defense against three wides. We were trying a bunch of different things. It just, uh, you know, we were up to for suggestions. I can promise you, we, right. we were trying everything. Yep. They, they were dead. I mean, that, that's what you come out of this game. Very simple. It was one of those ones you're just like, well, that turned quickly. And there were a couple of games <laughs> yeah. this year where you went, Ooh. it's not even the worst oh, one of this oh, yeah. season. Like I said, there's, save, there's, save, yeah, save that one. There's save two that. more coming up. <laughs> Yeah, so week eight, the, so the Bills reach the halfway point of the season. They welcome in the New England Patriots. Tom Brady is back. Who is he oh, ever? As Brady throws for 315 yards and four touchdowns, he has a 53-yarder to Rob Gronkowski and a 53-yarder to Chris Hogan, which is just, man, the guy you let slip go, let go away and the guy from your backyard just picks you apart. The first quarter he was coming at the press box, it felt like I was watching Michelangelo paint the Sistine Chapel. He was that good in the corner. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. He's so good. It really is. He's so good. And when we've, you know, and, and he's torched Rex and Rex. It, it, well, I, I can't say all the time because Rex got yeah. Rex. Rex got him a couple times with early the Jets. With, yeah. with the Jets. But since then, when he threw for 600 yards at the end of last season, <laughs> it's just like, oh, it's, it is what it is, and it's like. He has made you just look so foolish. Yeah, and with that win, Tom Brady is now 26 and three in his career against the Buffalo Bills. Ties an NFL record set by Brett Favre, who was 26 and nine against the Detroit Lions. Brady has hit 26 games, 26 wins in six last games. And one of those losses he played one quarter in because it was the last game of the season. They didn't care. Well, oh what's amazing <laughs> is that how many wins Brady has at New Era Field or Ralph Wilson Stadium. And he only plays there once a season, <laughs> yeah. and he'd be like the fourth all-time winning <laughs> quarterback. Like that is insane when you think about how how many wins he has at that stadium. You have to be on top of your your game plan. You can't uh, you can't blow things in your game plan. You can't give. Uh, uh, him second opportunities with penalties and things like that. He's 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 good enough to beat you. Uh, 
when you when you don't do all those things. So when you do all those things, it's a it snowballs. Way too many mistakes, mistakes that we haven't made all season. Uh, and against you know a guy like Brady, he makes you pay anytime you have a mistake. And we know that going in, and uh, and he was true to form. But we didn't deserve to win by any stretch. So week nine, the Bills go on the road to start the second half of their season. A Monday night game in Seattle against the Seahawks. I was there for this one, and ESPN is there. They have 9,000 cameras there, 9,000 members of their production staff, and the operation that they put on is super impressive. And uh, the, the room where the Bills conducted their press conferences was the same room where ESPN has their production meetings before the game. And you know, because it's a Monday night game, you get there super early. So I just happened to be in the room oh, yeah. during that production meeting, and you're listening to ESPN's best directors, photographers, producers, and you're like, I'm getting a master's course yeah. on how to put together an NFL game. Well, they didn't get something that I got because a couple minutes later, maybe an hour later, I'm shooting people walking out of the tunnel, and it's a good time to get coordinators, coaches, linemen, guys who aren't going to have the explosive plays. We're going to get plenty of shots of Tyrod Taylor. We're going to get plenty of shots of LaShawn McCoy. But here comes Catherine Smith, the special teams quality control coach, walking out onto the field. A couple other members of the coaching staff were there as well. And there was a, a fan sitting in the front row uh, at Quest Field or whatever the, the stadium in Seattle is called this week. And uh, he had been harassing every member of the Bills as they, as they were walking out on the field. But as uh, Catherine Smith walks out, he starts calling her waitress. And can I have a Pepsi, please? And, and just really just, just lame, disgusting stuff. And... You know, it's just like, what a, what a clown, you know, and as Catherine Smith walks by, no expression, no, she didn't turn around. Did no exactly reaction. what she was supposed to do. Exactly. Yeah. She just let the loser, you know, say whatever garbage he wanted to say. But because the voice was so distinct and because he was in the front row, I knew exactly where he was. So as soon as she walks away, I pan right back to this loser and just happens to be as he's still yelling at her. The woman standing next to him smacks him in the arm and says, enough. Yeah. Stop that. I remember shooting that thinking like, huh, well, I have all of that, but you know, you're in an NFL stadium, there's so much noise, I couldn't tell if I could actually get the, the audio yeah. of this clown shouting this stuff out. So I went, well, you know, okay, I have that, and I like, had that in the back of my mind. Um, but you know, it's a Monday night football game, there's now more people coming out of the field, there's a million things going on, and a football game to, to follow. It almost slipped my mind that I had this shot. I, I didn't know I had it, that well right. until well after the game, after I had filed my report, after the press conferences, I'm back in my hotel when I see uh, this clip happen. And then uh, overnight, you know, the, because again, it's the West Coast. So it's three hours later, you know, it, it's 10 o'clock in Seattle. It's one o'clock in the morning back here. So, you know, people are done for the night. People are going back home. So I just sending back video and I included it, this Catherine Smith thing. And I remember thinking like, oh, this is something I should tweet out tomorrow, you know, because I think it'll be, People will be awake for it. People will be aware of it. Yes, it is election day yeah. and a big election at that. Um, but uh, this is something that I think people should see. And so I tweeted it, hit the tweet button, turned the laptop off, packed it up, got in the car and went to the Seattle airport. By the time I get there, my phone's already blowing up. People are like, is it all right if I use this in a post? And I'm calling the station like, hey, we need to get this online. This is blowing up. <laughs> yeah. And it was on a day where obviously everyone in the country's mind is elsewhere, it's election day, uh, this was a major story in the NFL for 24 hours. It was, in the, the election day was going to be, we thought, the first woman being elected president. This was the first woman to have a coaching job in the NFL being treated like she doesn't belong. And juxtaposing that against Hillary Clinton's run and you know, potential victory as president of the United States was, I think, very poignant and, and very... Um, you know, um, impactful to a lot of people in America. Not to mention, it was just something dumb a guy shouldn't say. And hey, you know, in, in the TMZ world, that kind of stuff will blow up on social media. And it's funny, I'll, I'll take the other side of, that's why families don't want to go to games anymore. Mm. That's why there's no point, when you can sit at home and control everything around you, that's the, I think that, that's a reason why more kids aren't going, more families aren't taking their young kids, because you deal with these idiots 
that yeah. they don't represent. That guy doesn't represent all Seattle fans, but he ruins that experience for some of those people around him. My daughter's yeah. not going until she's at least 18. Yeah, yeah. I remember as a kid, you know, my, my dad was a Jets fan, and, you know, I, I, he didn't take me to any mm -hmm. football games when I was a kid. I wore that Tebow jersey to that Bills game. Whew. The, things, <laughs> the things that I heard walking out of that stadium. Yeah, I, you know, I, and I wonder about the atmosphere in games. I will say that I think it has gotten better. Maybe I'm wrong about that in the time that I've covered the team. I remember my first year covering the team. Uh, the Bills played the Washington uh, professional football team. Uh, the first preseason game I ever shot, RG3's first preseason game, and there were five fights, like in the lower bowl that like, you heard that sound and you saw like, like, oh my God, this yeah. is the first Bills game ever, mm -hmm. and it's a preseason game. I'm like, what did I walk into? There are, there are less fights now. I think, I think having, you know, cell phone technology where everybody has one, and therefore any dumb thing you do can be preserved forever, but more importantly that you can probably get the security with just touch of a button instead of being, you know, you're in a stadium with 70,000 people. There might be 700 security guards. You're still pretty well isolated from them yeah. for enough of a time that you can get a fight going. So I think those things have made it, but because yeah, used to be a Jets game was almost as good in the stands in terms of physical entertainment as it was on the field. Yeah, and, and I rem you know, going through clips over these years of seeing fans running on the field. Mm -hmm. Like, I haven't, uh, no, I take that back. I saw one happen in Seattle. Mm -hmm. A fan ran on the field in this same Seattle Seahawks game. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just don't, and maybe it's just, you know, anecdotal and it's just the things mm -hmm. I see. And maybe, you know, you're not keeping an eye on 78,000 people, so you don't know what everyone's doing. But it does seem like, you know, the, the junk that happens in the crowd is less than it was years ago, and maybe to your point, because because of cell phone video. We haven't even talked about this. I know the game's pretty game. good, too. Yeah. This game is insane. Yeah. It's 28-17 in the final seconds of the first half. The Bills are lining up for a field goal. I remember being on the field uh, in Seattle, and it was so loud. The, the, the things you hear about the noise in Seattle is 100% true. And to the point where I had earplugs in, because like if I didn't, I'd have like my, my hearing would have been gone. Mm. And so... Dan Carpenter there to, to kick a field goal right at the end of the first half. Uh, ball snapped. In comes Richard Sherman, just blows everything up. And flag comes out. Dan Carpenter doesn't even kick the ball. The ball is in Richard Sherman's hands. And uh, the call was, you know, offsides. And there's Dan Carpenter rolling around on the turf, holding his knee. And you go like, Whoa. and here come the trainers. And like, oh, well, now because that's the fourth time out of the half. And, just anarchy happens. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and it wasn't that long ago, so I'm sure you all remember what happened. But um, I remember being on the field, and Rex is dropping an F-bomb every other word to the officials, to the assistants, to anybody that would listen. And uh, Lisa Salters, who's the sideline reporter for ESPN, uh, was going to talk to Rex at the end of the half. And uh, LaShawn McCoy walks up. like This happened behind me, but I heard it as LaShawn goes to Lisa and goes, the hell's going on out here? What was that? Like, the players didn't know what was yeah. happening. Mm -hmm. Rex obviously didn't know what was happening. Uh, there were multiple snaps within three seconds of game time. Uh, there was a spiked ball. There was a too many men, or an, uh, a delay of game penalty. By the time Dan Carpenter actually kicked it in a line on the box score, it was no good. And the Bills going to halftime down 28-17. Mm -hmm. I know how insane it was on the field. What was it like watching that? Uh, similar, you know, you're trying to, you're on, you're going back and forth between Twitter and the game, trying to figure out, okay, there's 8,000 people watching this game with me on social media. We're all talking about what should be happening. The refs clearly had no idea what was going on. Whether you agreed or disagreed with a particular call, everybody agreed that they got two or three things wrong. It doesn't matter which two <laughs> or three, <laughs> you know? We all think we know football. Like, yeah. We cover football, and you're going like, I don't, are they right? Are, yeah. Wait, they're, they're wrong because, as you said after, then why wouldn't everybody just blow up the kicker? Yeah. yeah. Take five yards, and they're like, wait, but you can't. No, no you can. Yeah. I, I don't know what happened. Like, like, and I'm sitting there, like, explaining to my, at the time, fiance, like, I, I, I think that was the right call. <laughs> I'm not 100% I'm not sure. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. What, what was the explanation you were given by officials? Uh, it doesn't matter. It was wrong. I mean, the, you know, it's clear what happened. The guy roughed our kicker. You know, jumps off Cyrus, roughs our kicker, and then, uh, and then because we had to go out and attend to him, um, and it wasn't called roughing the kicker, then we had to spike the ball so we can come back in and kick. You know, he needed a little time there, but uh, you know, we, you know, we saw him go down, and our trainers ran out, and and that's that's what we had to do. And then of course they uh, 
they got to put the K ball out there and, and they don't reset the clock. So uh, from an efficiency standpoint, uh, I think he can do a little better than that. Yeah, yeah. Dean Blandino and the NFL come out and say that there should have been an unnecessary roughness penalty on Richard Sherman. Um, and then the second half of this game happens. I mean, there's just more things that just happened. But the Bills down six late in this game. Tyrod Taylor having what, maybe the best game of his career. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Robert Woods definitely had the best game of his, his career. He was terrific. Bills work it down to the Seattle 15. Tyrod gets sacked twice. But then on uh, the last play of the game on fourth goal, fourth and, uh, yeah, fourth and goal, Tyrod throws to the end zone. Richard Sherman decleats Walt Powell. The pass to, to Robert Woods is behind him. Game ends. Seattle wins 31-25. And uh, that was not a happy Bills team after that one. No, they, I mean, they had a right to be upset about the field goal situation at half. The, that was botched. No guarantee Carpenter would have made the field goal even 15 yards closer, but say la vie. The end of the game was on the Bills. And this was an example of Tyrod. This was good Tyrod and bad Tyrod because yeah, he was good Tyrod for, sure. for, for most of three and three quarters plus. And then that last drive, there's one play going back on on film. A few plays before they got to the 15 from the 30. He has Robert Woods open here, Charles Clay open here. Yeah. You throw to either one of them, it's probably six points or first and goal like at the two. And he decides to tuck and run. And this is what, what's been Tyrod's problem. He will not pull the trigger when he has to. And you just can't play like that up and down the field. So when they got to the end of the game, or when they got to, you know, where you needed to make a pass, he just didn't have enough opportunities left to do it. The decleating thing, totally legal, but they've changed the rule since. You can't do that now. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what I'm saying. That, that's, yeah. you know, oh, the, the, this, they got this wrong. Other side of the field, Tyrod wasn't even looking that way. I don't mean to say that, oh, that, that had nothing to do or that, oh, you have to look a blind eye to that side of the field for penalties, but it had no impact on that final play. Let's remember, when you've lost and missed the playoffs for 17 straight years, one thing you get a whole lot of practice at is blaming the officials. Ooh, and yeah. there is no fan base, I would argue, in professional and, sports. And that was the cherry on top yeah. of what the heck happened at the end of the first half. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Are these the replacement reps again? Like, what yeah. is going on? In Seattle, no less, too. And, uh, yeah, Richard Sherman probably won't be getting any free drinks nope. in Western New York. No. Well, no, he's mean mugging like he's doing and, you know, whatever. But, uh, you know, guy's a great player. But he, he did a, you know, I mean, I guess it wasn't as bad as I thought. You know, I thought he, I thought he roughed our kicker. You know, when, uh, you know, it was a ridiculous play. You know, no question. Then he's over on the sideline basically taunting us. And uh, so I had some words. I mean, I think I said that, you know, you're too good a player to act like an, like an ass. I think that's what I said. So the Bills go into the bye at four and five. They come out of it. They go on the road uh, to take on the Cincinnati Bengals. And uh, Sammy Watkins is out, though he's eligible to return. A.J. Green is injured one minute into the game. I remember being in Cincinnati thinking, oh, man, I get to see A.J. Green. He plays one minute, and then he's off on a stretcher. And uh, I can't remember if he was done for the year, but definitely done for that game. For my fantasy team, too. Yeah, it's a big, big hit for <laughs> fantasy guys nationwide. Uh, Andy Dalton picked off twice by Stephon Gilmore. Mike Nugent misses not one, but two point-after attempts. Bills win 16-12 in a really nondescript game. But that was a game going in, there was question marks about the secondary of, like, can anybody cover anybody? And on top of that, you're going up against A.J. Green. Well, they didn't need to worry about A.J. Green, but that was when the, the question marks of, is there an open competition? Who's playing? Who has the corner spot? Is Darby really, because he, he got exposed again? Um, Nikel Roby Coleman got exposed again in that game, and you're like, oh, who's playing where? Well, yeah, Jimmy Graham had a huge game in that Week 9 game, and he has huge games yeah. against a lot of teams. But, yeah, they were definitely question marks and problems with the Bills defense and secondary. So the Bills win in Cincinnati in week 10, week 11 to go five and five. Saturday, November 26, Watkins activated from the IR. He is back, baby. Week 12, they take on the Jacksonville Jaguars and a game that probably shouldn't have been, e should have been easy was not, but mm -hmm. they still won. That was an exciting game. That was a fun game. That's a Jaguars game. I'm yeah. just saying, I'm being, okay, again, we've covered a lot of these. Okay, I'm just saying, again, new guy in the <laughs> department. There were points all over the place, and it was like, this was, this was a fun game for a new guy with the camera. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, the Bills trailed 21-20 in the fourth quarter thanks to a Blake Bortles touchdown. Bortles does it again against the Bills. Uh, Alan Hearns with the touchdown, but Tyrod Taylor to Justin Hunter. You were all over that, that one, man. Great. Was, well done, thank sir. You. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so the Bills win 28-21. They bring a winning record into the month of December. I think I looked it up. It was like the third or fourth, second. I think the second time ever they had done that. They had gone into December with a winning During record. During the drought. During the drought, yeah. yeah. So six and five with, uh, what, six games, five games remaining mm -hmm. in the 2016 season. And we mentioned Chantrell Henderson earlier on Tuesday, November 29th. He suspended 10 games for a second uh, marijuana violation. And, um, yeah, again, uh, it's a, a mm -hmm. black and white issue, and there's no gray area for a guy right. that deserves 
that benefit of the doubt. December 4th, week 13, the Bills in Oakland. Dan, you and I were there in California. This was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. Bills up 10-9 at halftime. Well, Sean McCoy rips off a 54-yard run right at the start of the second half. Tyrod Taylor scores on the next play to put the Bills up 17-9. Oakland goes three and out. Mike Gillisley scores another touchdown for the Bills. They're up 24-9 against a good Oakland Raiders team. I remember being on the field, looking at the scoreboard, thinking, are they really going to do this? Jerry Hughes is pointing at the fans, laughing at them, just going back and forth. And I'm like, oh, wow, we're, we're talking smack already. Okay, well, you're up by 15. I can't say you haven't earned it. For the dump that is that O.Co. Coliseum, the, those fans, you were in awe. You've been to more stadiums than I have. Pre-game was like, this is cool. Yeah. Like, this black <laughs> hole is a real thing. Yep. Especially with that team being good and promised with Derek Carr and Amari Cooper and all, and all this stuff. You're like, this is cool. All yeah. right. And then they were silent. Yep. The Bills were just moving the ball up and down the field to start that second half. And you're like, oh, my gosh. This, like, this, is, this was a game that you're like, if they, if they win this one, they might really, we might really start you know, checking off some games on the line. Yeah. Now, and, and here's the thing. You know, and especially doing down and drought and having this hindsight now, is that you look to like the high moments. At what point were the Bills closest to making the playoffs? Obviously, 2004, Week 17, win and get in. You know, Nate Clements has a pick six. Their odds of making the playoffs in that position had to be exponentially higher than this moment in Week 13. But with the Bills up 24 and 9, looking at a 7 and 5 record with four games remaining and games against Cleveland. Miami, yeah, who beat them earlier, but not a great Miami team, and a Jets team that, as we've said, has turned into a tire fire. They are going to win probably nine games, maybe ten, and get into the playoffs, and the drought is over. At this moment, when it's 24 to 9, and then I don't know what happened. I was there, you were there, you watched on TV, many more people watched it on television. It all fell apart so quickly. Twitter was so hot. Twitter oh, was I can so only hot. Imagine. It was just like, Oh, the Raiders aren't that good. The Raiders aren't that good. The Raiders aren't that good. And I just remember, like, we don't see the Raiders a whole lot unless you're watching, you know, whether for your fantasy team or something like that. And I just remember, like, I think they've had some comebacks. Like, if they, if, like, and this offense is potent. Like, if they could get it going, you know, and all of a sudden it was like, oh, my. Oh, they got it going. Yeah. Oh, oh my. Yeah, so Derek Carr has a touchdown pass to Michael Crabtree. With 5.17 left in the third quarter, that made it 24-16 Buffalo. And there was a little bit of, like, murmurs. It was like steam coming up. <laughs> this, is, this place is getting loud again. Yeah. The Bills go three and out. Mm -hmm. Latavius Murray has a one-yard touchdown run. With 57 seconds left in the third quarter, the Bills are in front 24-23. Getting a little bit louder now. And then the Bills go three and out again. The start of the fourth quarter, Derek Carr to Amari Cooper, 37-yard touchdown pass with 14.08 left in the game. So in a total of six minutes, the Bills have gone from up 24-9 to down 30-24 to Oakland. And they were long drives, but they were like chunks of yards. Yeah. It was like yeah. 15, 27, 30. You're like, oh boy, like yeah. they just, how about just an incomplete pass? And it was yeah. like, it was like, oh, it was just the nosebleed, just like pouring out, <laughs> it was like, couldn't stop anything. Yeah, you nick yourself shaving and you're like, I think I cut an artery. <laughs> I'm like, this, this will not stop bleeding and I think I need to go to the and hospital. Again, like you said earlier, it was like, just get a first down. Just get a first down, just mm. like take that deep breath. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, oh, they're off the field again. They're off the field again. Oh, this, this in, is in the micro, this is a Tyrod Taylor problem because you just can't do it with his offense. You know, you just, he doesn't have enough op things that he can do positively that allows you to get first downs. Exactly. But in the macro, you don't get to 17 years missing the playoffs without being able to pull a switcheroo like this, <laughs> like that. And the Bills have gotten so good at it. You could just see it. And when you're in it, you're like, it's like all over. You can't get out of it. You're like, just get it off of me. It's like the little well, animals crawling up here. Yeah. They don't know how to get out. It got so bad. Like, I was down in the, the, the interview room, the weight room, the, that Oakland A's the weight room that they put you in. With like six minutes left in the fourth quarter, like I didn't need to be near the phone or, or my laptop, it was over. Yeah. Like you went from within 15 minutes, just a complete, just like, wow. <laughs> it's not even quick. over. There's still <laughs> more to come. It was over. I mean, it was <laughs> over, but yeah, uh, the Bills, after trailing now 30 to 24, they go three and out for a third consecutive drive. And I just remember being on the field like, wow, this team is just awful. They cannot do anything right. That was probably like, the maddest I've been at this team, and I don't really care if they win or lose. I'm not a Bills fan. I've never been a Bills fan. But you, like, are, as a football observer, 
She's like, just do one thing right. <laughs> one thing right. Well, the Bills are pinned deep in their own territory after this touchdown from Amari Cooper. And Tyrod Taylor, just because this is the drought, because it's been 17 years, there needs to be that extra twist of the knife in the ribs because Khalil Mack, the guy from the University of Buffalo, the guy they passed on when they drafted Sammy Watkins after the trade-up a couple years prior, comes and hits Tyrod Taylor on the arm as he throws the ball, picked off by the Oakland Raiders at the Buffalo 15, who then march right down two plays later. To, that's when they hit the two-point conversion to go up 38-24. And I just went, wow, what a stupid football team. <laughs> Already in the weight room. Already in the weight room. <laughs> when that play happened, like, this game's over. And then it's like, well, they're, they, they're still scoring, guys. They're still scoring on the team because they had the TV on the weight room. It's just like, man, this game, like, the Bills had this game in hand. And I know it's probably been said a couple of times on this <laughs> down in trial. But it was like, yeah, they got this in hand. This is, this is awesome. They're doing it on the road in the black hole. And it was like, nope, didn't do it. When you cover a team like this 365 days a year, it really comes down to those 16 days. So you're always, I know when I'm watching on TV, I'm like, I can't get any work done. I'm just like, you know. Oh <laughs> yes, God, oh yes. And then 38-24. I turn back to the keyboard and I'm done. <laughs> back to work. Yeah, and, and then uh, just the, the, a second cherry on top as, as Khalil Mack has a strip sack fumble on mm. the next Bills drive. So five consecutive drives for the Bills, three three and outs, a, an interception, mm. and a fumble caused by Khalil Mack. And we can pretty much skip the games for the rest of the year. The rest yeah. of the year was well, they're outside still, of the Well, they're still alive at mm. this point. They're six and six with four games remaining. But they were alive. They had to run the table, though. And they, they had to run the table, but, you know, Pittsburgh at home, Press Cleveland, <laughs> Miami. Just, I just, oh, my gosh. I, in the Jets. Was it going in this Cleveland game? It was, I think it was after the Cleveland game where, like, Rex was like, yeah, we're not in it. And you we were like, but you're still, like, I know you need help. Like, it, we're getting to Christmas, and I remember my stand-up being like, well, it wouldn't be a miracle on 34th or 1st mm. Street or whatever. It was, it'd be a miracle on 1-Bills Drive yeah, for them yeah. to make the playoffs. But you sit there, and, like, Rex had thrown in the towel. Like, there was writings on the walls after this that the team quit. That locker room was in shock. And I know I haven't been to a lot of games where, you know, you've been there, but, like, it was, like, silent. And, like, the only person that talked was, like, Ryan Groy for, like, the first five minutes. <laughs> and now, you're, like, you're right. That Oakland locker room was very silent. Where you're like, so, Ryan, like, what happened in that, uh... <laughs> like, you're like, you don't even get to talk to any stars. Like, like they, yeah. they were so disgruntled. You're like, ah, uh, nope. They're not ready yet. In the home of one of the NFL's best, the Bills look like a team ready to make a major statement and then it all fell apart. For the second straight week, LaShawn McCoy opened the second half with an explosive play. With the Bills up 10-9, McCoy goes for 54 yards. The Bills scored on the next play and at one point led by 15. Then the Raiders took over. First minute of the fourth quarter, Oakland down by one. Derek Carr to Amari Cooper for the go-ahead score, part of a 29-0 run by the Raiders. The Bills had no answers on the field and were still looking for answers afterward as the Raiders win 38-24. I mean, it just didn't go well today. Like we planned, we had a great game plan for this for this game. Um, we kind of pushed them around up front. The, the guys up front really blocked well. We couldn't close it out. We had too many errors, you know, and uh, obviously we we turned it over twice. We never managed to turn over on defense, and and, uh, and that was a you know a big difference in the game. I thought. Um, Thought we got on our heels and we never got off. Week 14, yes, the Bills are alive, but they're not really alive. As the snow is coming down in western New York as the Bills get ready to take on the Pittsburgh Steelers, Jason Lockenfora, our dear friend Jason Lockenfora, reports that Rex could be fired as early as Monday. Tim Graham tweets, the firing before the end of the season is on the table. It is possible that Rex is out. And then Le'Veon Bell turns into Jim Brown, Barry Sanders, and any other legendary running back you can think of as Bell rushes for 236 yards and three touchdowns. He has four receptions for 62 yards. Big Ben did not have a great game. The Steelers win 27-20. And uh, yeah, the writing's looking to be on the wall for Mr. One Rex Ryan. The stakes for this game were simple for the Bills. Beat the Steelers and keep their season alive. Instead, they folded. Yes, the conditions were rough, but that didn't bother Le'Veon Bell, whose 298 total yards were more than the entire Bills offense put together. And now with this 27-20 loss, the Bills are looking at a 17th consecutive season without postseason football. It sucks. Um, we knew going into the game, the situation, uh, we knew what we had to do. I mean, it's just, it's just a tough situation. Obviously, you got to come out here and get a victory, and we weren't able to do it. And I mean, we're not good enough. We knew what type of back he was, real patient guy, and um, 
we just didn't tackle well. That's mainly what it came down to. I mean, there was a few misfits on defense, but uh, it came down to us not tackling well. So we have a, a Bills loss and a big game to a team that has a much better history, reputation. Um, we have the coach possibly being fired. You know what the most Bills part of that game was? Was the rubber pellets being on the field at halftime that delayed the second I, half. I laid it up for you and you Be knocked it out. Because they were trying to to dust some of the snow off the field. They had the, the snow plow set at an incorrect setting. They kicked up all those little rubber pellets that we all get in our sneakers after in shoes and boots after covering those games. And our lungs. Yeah, yeah that also probably true. Um, <laughs> and they had to, Rex was helping, had to shovel, brush, whatever you want to call it, the rubber pellets off the field. And of course, it, it was funny. At first, you were wondering, well, they'll probably get them off and it'll be no big deal. But then it lasted long enough to where it became a big deal everywhere. So everybody in America who was watching football at some point had their broadcast cut the buffalo so you could see, ha ha, look at those stupid yeah. bills again, making a mistake. It, and, and, you know, whatever, it was a dumb Sorry. thing. They did not deserve the criticism they took, but it was the most bills drought moment of that game. Yeah, it really was. I mean, there really is, this team just has such a knack for adding that extra layer of insult mm -hmm. to whatever bad thing they're doing yeah. on the field. And my God, the pellets on the field were just brutal. Week 15, the Bills take on the Cleveland Browns. Bills win 33-13. Yeah, there, there was no talk that week about the Browns. Oh, you still got it. Hey, you know, if this happens and that happens, this happens. It was like, Rex, do you know that you're going to be fired? Yeah. It yeah. was, Rex, do you know you're going to be fired? And, no, I, I don't know what you're talking about. It's like, really? Really? Mm -hmm. like, you know, no, I haven't had, I, oh, I, no, but I do talk with the Pagulos every week. But, yeah. but, but, but it's all fine. And it's yeah. like, so all these people are wrong. That, that's what the story became. So like all these leaks that have been going on this entire season about Sammy Watkins and Carlos Will and all these things, they're all wrong, but you think you're going to stay. And it became, this me it became this battle with the media of like, no, I'm here. And they're going to have to drag me out kicking, kicking and screaming. screaming. They're going to they're gonna take me kicking and screaming out of this place. And one day that'll happen, but, and I'll be doing it that way. <laughs> you know, but it's, uh, uh, you know, I ain't, I ain't worried about that. So I think it's, it ain't going to happen for a long time. Well, on the morning of that Cleveland Browns game, 7.30 a.m., Adam Schefter, another reporter, adds his take to the pile as uh, Schefter reports that the Bills likely to fire Rex Ryan after the season. Sure. Well, Christmas Eve, Saturday game, week 16 against the Miami Dolphins. This game was entertaining as hell. Mm -hmm. You were on the field for that one. I was up in the press box, and Matt Moore versus Tyrod Taylor all of a sudden became this great battle, and somehow... It ends up with Tyrod Taylor seemingly leading the Bills to victory in the, in the regular season home finale as Tyrod Taylor connects with Charles Clay with a minute 22 to go to put the Bills in front. Dan, you are on the field just to think that the Bills trailed 28-14 in the fourth quarter and came back and looks like they've taken the lead for good. He hits Charles Clay over the middle and you're like, and the play before he had missed him. And you're like, oh my gosh. And they ran the same play again and he hit him and you're like, they did it. This, oh, you know, they haven't given up yet. They've still got fight left in them. And then it was like the kickoff, and it was boom, boom, and they hit him on like a long pass, and that's when the chaos happened. Because you didn't know how much time was left. The Bills had a timeout, and they're in between what to do with their field goal team. Whether they were going to keep on, they, they didn't have, they couldn't spike it because it was like a third and long. The Dolphins. Yeah. So they didn't know if they could spike it. They didn't know whether, what they were going to do, whether they are going to rush it or what. And there's chaos, and I don't know where to be. <laughs> and I'm running up and down yeah. the sidelines going, do I go for the field goal? Are they going to go for the play? What's happening? And then... I don't even know the kicker. Uh, Franks. Franks. Franks hits a <laughs> I bomb. didn't write down his first name. <laughs> Bubba. <laughs> Bubba Franks. Yeah. It's a bomb. And you're just like. 55 yarder. And it was just chaos. It was a long play. And you're like, they don't have time to get the, they don't even have time to get their field goal team out. And you're like, oh, they might get a snap off. Oh, we won't make it. This is in the cold and 50 something yards. Bang. Yeah. You're yep. like, wow. Yep. And Rex didn't mm -hmm. call that timeout either. He tried to. But he couldn't get it in. Oh, true. That yeah, was, we didn't was... know that. You know, you wouldn't know that on the field. But yeah, on the mm -hmm. TV broadcast, they had Rex doing this. But he got it in too late after the snap uh, as Franks kicks the game. Winner. Actually, that might have been an overtime. Uh, no, no, the overtime. The Rex botches. There were there were several. Yeah, in this the overtime game. was the punt. Was the, the punt? Yeah. Well, that was yeah. no. But I'm thinking if Rex tried to ice the kicker in overtime. Oh, I'm not sure. Thank Whatever. Uh, so the game goes to overtime, tied at uh, 31. And uh, yeah, in overtime. First and 10 to Miami 17. LaShawn well, McCoy with a loss of two. Uh, yeah, the Bills get it down inside. That's right. Yes. The Bills get it inside the Miami red zone. LaShawn well, McCoy lost to Reggie Bush. Oh, the a Bush. loss of nine. <laughs> Whatever it was. Oh, it was yeah. the Reggie Bush reverse. Yeah. Yep. Oh, the Bills ran a reverse for one Reginald Bush. Uh, it was a loss of eight. And as much as we've killed the Bills for having playoff chances, they did have 
reasonable playoff chances, at least to talk about at this point. Yeah, they were mathematically alive. Absolutely. They said they weren't scoreboard watching, but like things were falling the right way yeah, at that, that time when you're game. like, yeah. okay, like just, just pull it together for this overtime. Yeah. Like just pull it together for this overtime. Nope, they didn't. Dan Carpenter misses a 45 yard field goal. But then the Bills force Miami to punt, so the Bills get the ball back, and hey, you know, move the ball down the field. You, you've already proven it once. Yeah. Dan Carpenter has been unreliable, but if you can do it again, you're going to put yourself in position to kick another game-winning field goal. Well, the offense hits a snag, as it tends to do under this Rex Ryan era. Uh, and then with 4.09 left in the game, four minutes and nine seconds left of your season, where you need a win to keep your playoff chances alive, and you know with four minutes left, you probably aren't going to get the ball back again with any reasonable amount of time. Point being, tie does not help you at all. Correct. Yeah. Tie does not help you. You need a, vi a win, a win, a, a victory. Yeah. Rex Ryan decides to punt. And uh, this was the first time I had been in the press box at Ralph Wilson Stadium, New Era Field, when uh, a head coach has committed a blunder like this. And it was, I don't know, 100, 200, 300 medias of the me media, all at the same time from all different walks of, of the media, whether it be online, television, print, radio. Miami or going, Buffalo. Yeah, yeah. Miami or Buffalo going, what are they doing? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and out comes Colton Schmidt to hit a punt. I don't even remember how far it went. doesn't matter because they made that decision. Rex made that decision with 4.09 left of your season. And News 8 does not have it on film. That's right. Eh, well, it's a <laughs> punt. It, the, the camera, the, the battery, or the card space was running out. So at this point, I'm like, I'm picking place which ones to go. And in the heat of the moment, you're running up and down the sidelines, as I'm sure you guys, you guys have talked about in the chaos. And I'm just like, yeah, they're punting. What, whatever. Like, oh, okay, I got to get down to the other way. And I'm coming in, and Prescott, the first thing he says, he goes, did you get the punt? And I went, what punt? <laughs> like, fourth quarter? Like, I don't know what you're talking about. He's like, they punted in with, with three minutes left. I was like. I don't know, man. Like, I, I, I got, it was really cold. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was anarchy. He had seen five full quarters, too. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, was, it was a terrible decision. There's no excusing it. You got to know the situation. And look, man, Rex has done how many different bad coaching things off season, on, on field, off field, whatever. This was the last and the most important and the one that and eventually got him fired, more or less. With 10 guys on the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 10 guys on the field for the Jay uh, Oh, that's right. Yeah, after the punt, Jay Ajayi runs 57 yards with 10 Bills on the field because Stephon Gilmore is in concussion protocol, so the Bills have 10 guys out there. Next play, uh, Franks, our dear friend Franks, uh, hits a 27-yard game winner. It was the night before Christmas, and all through this house, a creature was stirring, leaking news that the Bills may fire head coach Rex Ryan and hand the reins over to offensive coordinator Anthony Lynn. And this game may have sealed it. The Bills offense racked up more yards than they ever have in a game in franchise history. They also rallied from three separate 14-point deficits. But the Bills defense was poor throughout. Rex Ryan was late calling a timeout before the game tying field goal and then chose to punt with four minutes remaining in overtime when a tie would end their postseason hopes. Ryan defended his decisions afterward, even as this 34-31 overtime loss officially keeps the Bills out of the playoffs for a 17th straight season. Every coach in America would have done the same thing, backed up in your, your end, one, one first down away. And it's easy to sit back up there when your livelihood's not riding on it and say, hey, I'd go ahead and and do this and this. I'm sure you would. Whatever happens, happens. But I'm going to tell you this, that, uh, you know, I'll stand by my reputation. Let's just put it that way. Well, the following day is Christmas. So everybody gets to enjoy time with their families, have a nice meal, some porridge or something. Monday, December 26th, the Bills go back to work. You were there. I think you were there. Were you there? No, I was... For the Rex presser, Rex's final presser as oh, yeah. head coach? Yeah. Oh, when he came out looking disheveled. Yes. And Rex looked like he hadn't slept in a week. Yeah. And, no uh, hat. Rex always came out with a hat. And yep. he came out hatless. And that, that was the side-by-side -side of, like, the day that he came to Buffalo and, like, the day that he was leaving. And he seemed like a guy that had just gotten kicked in the junk, like, six <laughs> times. <laughs> and you were like, oh, man, this guy... And he said all the right things, and oh, we're gonna keep fighting. But it was totally uncomfortable the whole time. It was. Yeah. It was like, and like mon the Monday media crew is different, and so it was kind of like, kind of a skeleton crew. But it was just like, man, this guy knows he's getting canned. <laughs> he knows he's yeah. getting. Yep. You you said that your livelihood and the job you do is affected by wins and losses. So, yep. theoretically speaking, is it fair to judge that after? only two seasons in today's culture of the NFL? I mean, well, I, I, I think the, the only person that it needs to affect the only people is, uh, is Terry and Kim Pagula. That, that's who, who's going to make that decision on, on whether I'm here, whether this person's here or whatever. That, that's who makes that decision. And so 
whatever they think is is fair, that's the only thing that matters. You know, as a coach, I, I can just go out. That's why I said I'm going to try to win this game. Trust me, I'm going to try to win this game. It doesn't matter that it doesn't mean anything. To me, it means a lot. I want to win the game. And that that's just uh, that's who I am. You know, uh, uh, the thing is, it doesn't, it, like I say, it doesn't have to be fair or or isn't fair or is fair or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's, you know, uh, I'm going to do the best job I can, just like always. It's uh, just when is that, ex, that ax going to come down and start chopping heads? Well, it would happen to be the very next day on uh, December 27th, uh, a day, a Tuesday, which is always a quiet day, especially after Christmas and especially after the Bills have been eliminated from the playoffs. Though we were monitoring for when this news would happen, uh, I remember uh, having to be at my aunt's house. Was in pajamas, enjoying, I think it might have been brunch, maybe just a cup of coffee, and seeing on my phone, oh, the Bills have dismissed Rex Ryan as head coach, and going, oh, here we go. <laughs> see Bye, family. I'll see you all next Christmas, uh, because, uh, yeah, time, time to, to go north. Yeah. The most unusual thing about this was the timing. And to allow Rex to come out and do his Monday press conference as if he was going to coach the last game and then to fire him on Tuesday was unusual. I think as we found out later, you know, Rex wanted to play Tyrod Taylor. And as you brought up like an hour ago in this uh, broadcast, they didn't want him to do that because if Tyrod gets hurt, if he blows out a knee or something, then the Bills are on the hook for that $27.5 million. They didn't have anything to play for. They really had a young quarterback, Cardell Jones, who you know, needed some time. You could have used the game on the field. So for Rex to run Tyrod in for a meaningless game against the Jets, it was a fireable offense. So I think the only thing that happened is disheveled Rex, who had you know, seen the three ghosts of football coaching press, <laughs> past, present, and future, um, visited with uh, Terry Pagula and told him he was going to play. Tyrod Taylor and Doug Willie said, um, excuse me, that's a bad idea. And they had to get rid of the guy who was going to play Tyrod, and Rex was that guy. Yeah, and then uh, December 27th began a day that Dan, you and I will remember for a very long yes. time. Unbelievable. Do you want to, uh, I mean. No, 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 you, no, you lead. All right, all right, all right. Uh, so, okay. Well, the, the Bills have fired a head coach. We've, we've gone through this mm -hmm. before. Couple Dan, times. this is your yeah. first time. You always remember your first time. For you, it was Rex Ryan. You got a good one. I, I had Chan Gailey. And again, it wasn't... and again, it was, I got into the station first. I'm packing stuff up. I know Prescott's coming. And Thad's <laughs> just like, go up to Buffalo. Kind of what you guys have said, John Cutts yeah. could just go there. And we're like sitting there, and Prescott and I are like, well, what are we going to, nobody's well, going to. The funny thing is, I was going to send you by yourself. And then Prescott comes in, I'm like, you know, I don't have a lot for Prescott to do. Why don't you guys just both go? I want, I want to have everybody in Orchard Park just in case. Yeah, so we load up the car. Dan's driving. And... We're wondering, hey, you know, like, uh, what are we going to get? There's no, I mean, you know, the Bills probably don't have anybody there in their facility. So, you know, what are we going to do? Who are we going to talk to? So I'm thinking, oh, I don't know. I mean, we should go to Orchard Park, obviously, but I'm not quite sure what we're going to get out of that. So I just get on my phone and just start looking up, where does Rex Ryan live? Because that could be in the public record. And sure enough, it is. Because Rex and his wife would buy a house and... You know, let that be a public sale. Mm -hmm. So we go to Rex's house. We find Rex's house. It's not far from Orchard Park. Rex bragged in his first press conference, find me a house in the snowiest part of town on the snowiest hill in town. Well, we found a spot in Orchard Park. That happens to be where Rex Ryan lives. And Rex wasn't there. There was nobody there. So we go back to One Bill's Drive, and sure enough, there's Rex's truck. Well, okay, Rex hasn't, what we think, Rex hasn't left. Maybe he took a cab or something home and said, left the bills with the truck and said, you figure this out. But okay, fine. Well, whatever. So well, I was skeptical that Rex was, would be there. Because at this, yeah, point, we didn't at know, this it, point, it was like 3 o'clock. And yeah. he had gotten fired at like 11, 10, 30, 10, 30, 11, 30, 11, something like that. So we're yeah. like, Yo, if you get fired, like, I want out. Yeah. I, want, yeah. I want to be out. And, I want to be out. and we pull into One Bill's Drive, and it's like, there's a the truck. There's, there's truck, truck there. <laughs> and, and it's hard to miss a truck. Any Bills fan knows that... Bill's decal truck, you yeah. know it's there. And I'm sitting there like, there it is. He's, he's still here, and it's parked right in front of where all their offices are to the side of the, the, the training center. We parked in the one spot. Prescott goes in the media to see what's going on, and I said, well, I'm just going to stay here and all the camera on just in case, you know, he's, he's going to have to come out. Something is going to happen with this truck. Yeah. <laughs> and like I Whether said, it what, gets towed away or like Rex said, drives and away. And again, it's not the perp walk or anything like that, but it's like the sad puppy leaving. And again... But Rex is bigger than just a head coach because he came in with so much bluster. And this is why I felt compelled to find Rex at any cost was because he meant so much. And he was the most visible member of Western New York, not only of a football player, not only of an athlete. Like, you think of Western New York nationally, globally, there's one person. 
and that's Rex Ryan. And so when you say like, oh, he's, you know, he's, 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 you know, he's a private guy. He's just a citizen. Like you should leave him alone. No, he's as much a public figure as the mayor, as the governor, as a senator of anybody. Everyone knows who Rex Ryan is. And if he gets canned after another crappy season, we're going to go find him. And so we pull in one bill's drive and his truck is still there hours later. So the thought was like, okay, I'm going to go in the meeting room, see if there's anything there. And we're going to make sure that when that truck leaves, whoever's driving it, we're going to have video of it. Well, it. And while I'm in the media room talking to people, uh, also warming up while like, you're like, in the not, car. Not five minutes later. Yeah, right? yeah something yeah. like that. You come running in, and what did you have to tell me? It was so surreal to think, like, all of a sudden the truck lights went on. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, he's going to come out. Like, here he comes walking out the door, the main door. Well, he apparently had snuck out the side door that I didn't see. So I'm like, I had already, when you left, I put the battery in the camera. I turned the camera on. I'm just like, oh, I'm just, you know, if something happens. Sure enough, something happened. He's, and all of a sudden, I thought he was walking out the door. He had, sure enough, he had already been in his truck. He'd gotten on the, the passenger side. He's on my, in front of me, and it's backing up. I'm like, oh my gosh, here it is. Like, here's the final time Rex Ryan will ever leave One Bill's Drive after he said, you're gonna have to drag me out kicking and screaming. He's gonna go out with his tail between his legs in his decked out <laughs> Bill's truck <laughs> like only Rex Ryan could, and walking back in the media room just being like, <laughs> well, the, the other part of it is too is that that's that's the money shot. You're the only one there. You are the only one. No one has found Rex. I mean, you, you go into the media room and find out that no one has any idea where he is, if he's going to talk, yep. if there's going to be any interview. And Come Dan, Dan is the only one in you know all of NFL media nationwide because everybody wants to know about what happens to Rex but nobody Ryan. Nobody wanted to see outside because it was so cold. Yeah, it was and December because, 27th. And yeah. because of the p place that we parked. I pretty much shot the beginning of it inside the car because yeah. that was warm. And I was like, I'm the new guy. I'm going to sit in the car and mm. just like you did for Mario. I'm just going to sit here and wait. And nothing's going to happen. And he starts to pull away. And it's like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Just make sure you hit record. And it, he drives away and walking back into the media room. And there's everybody. Did you walk? I think it seemed like it was, you ran it. It was like. Rex. <laughs> it was, just, was, just, was it him? Was it, it him, Lassie? It was, it was him. Was, <laughs> he's, he's just gone. He's gone. He, he drove away. And they're like. No. <laughs> I was like, yeah, anybody else? I'm like, are you sure else? it was yeah. him? Like I said, I was like, oh my gosh, like this is incredible. And like they're like, like, here's the card, put it on Twitter. Like, like that was like yeah, one of those yeah. like giddy moments yeah. where you're like, I've got yep. gold. You have the yeah. golden ticket. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. like out of all the things that Rex Ryan's done in the media room and, and like I said, there was the time where it was like, I got it, there it is. And that was just, you know, that last time that Rex will well, in Buffalo, that he'll, yeah. he was ever seen. Yeah. And then it got better the next day. Well, it, it, <laughs> well, it was still better the same day. Yeah. Because Rex leaves in his truck, oh, and we go, did. where's Rex going? Oh, my God. And, uh, you know, so we know where his house is. We know where it is in relation to One Bill's Drive. And uh, enough time has passed, so I feel comfortable telling this story. Because <laughs> we haven't really told this to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, okay, well, we know where, well, the Bills have a head coach now. So, you know, it's not like... I don't feel bad about it. I don't feel guilty about it. I know some people got really mad about it, but whatever. So we start going towards Rex's house. And like, I don't know, you know, if we're going to, uh, a few God. minutes have passed. I don't know if we're going to find him. I mean, we know what his truck looks like, duh. You know, he basically drives a billboard for the Buffalo Bills. And as we're getting toward the highway, maybe half a mile down the road, Dan's driving. I just go like, I think that's Rex's truck. And, <laughs> and like, you're, you're like, you're like, no way, no way, no way. I'm like, yeah, I think, I think he's, I think he's getting on the highway. Like, like, see if we can catch up to him. Like, get to the highway, get to his house. So we get off the exit to, uh, to head toward Rex's house, and uh, as you know, that we're we're gaining distance on this truck, and then like, oh my God, it's Rex. <laughs> it is absolutely 100% Rex Ryan, uh, or at least Rex Ryan's truck. And uh, so as we pull into. Uh, I think he lives in, in, technically it's Orchard Park. It might be East Aurora, but whatever. Um, and uh, so we're coming upon a, a traffic light oh. and we're directly behind Rex Ryan. So I call you like, we're following Rex Ryan back <laughs> to his house. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> I, you know, I, we would like to talk to him because again, he is that public figure and mm. you want to get some statement from him. Even if it's just... You also didn't want to be the person who didn't have it. You know, if everybody yeah. else had it, you know, you didn't want to be the one who didn't we, have it. And we wanted yeah. to, you know... It, if Rex says, hey, I'm not talking, or hey, I love Bill's fans, I'm sorry this didn't work out, or hey, if he says Terry Pagula can go stuff it, I wanted to get that mm -hmm. shot. Whatever he says, it's valuable, it's newsworthy. And we start going toward Rex's house, and then Rex turns. And we go, wait a minute, like, 
you got to go this way to get to his house. Why are you going, going that way? And we didn't know what to do, so let's follow. Where is he going to go? <laughs> Long story short, we ended up like meeting at like a fork, and then we ended up in front of Rex Ryan, yeah. heading to his house. What eventually <laughs> happened is, as we, be, we were the hunter, then we became the hunted. <laughs> as Rex in his, blue, his Bill's truck starts following us, and we go like, well, if Rex sees us pull into his neighborhood, he might not come to his house. So like, Dan, floor it, you know, just take off. We get to Rex's house. Rex shows up a moment later. And um, yeah, so we, you know, waited a few minutes. He pulled into his garage, so we didn't see him get out of his truck, but we saw him, it was definitely Rex. And uh, we waited a few minutes, so then, you know, put the camera down and just went and knocked on the door just to see if Rex would come out, say anything, to Bills fans, to the Bills, to the Pagulas, to anybody. Because we felt like that was the thing to do. Mm -hmm. Because you said so much for the last two years and now you're gonna go away quiet. Like, I didn't feel that that was acceptable. Mm -hmm. So, we knocked on the door, Rex opens, we hear dogs barking. We go, oh, Rex is gonna release the hounds on us. <laughs> and, then, and then you hear a voice from behind the door like, hey, 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 easy, easy. Rex's voice, a thousand percent. Like, oh my God, he's gonna answer the door. Yeah. Opens the door up a crack and just goes, sorry dudes, I'm not talking to you. Close. And we're like, oh, fair. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. But he didn't want to talk. That's fine. At least we have that, that we have found. I, I, we, I mean, yeah, I, it, was, it was a tough call. We, we debated it back here about whether to continue to have you guys, you know, go and find Rex at his house. And at the end of the day, you know, I think there was a part of it too. We wanted Rex to have a say because everybody was taking shots at Rex. He yeah. had become yeah. the pinata. You know, and, and, you know. He was out of candy. He's, yeah, very much so. He needed to have an opportunity to say anything if he wanted to say. Now, obviously, there's a part of it to where you're like, it's Rex, and you know anything can come out of that mouth. And there's kind of a, um, uh, someone watching the train wreck kind of thing. You know, the, I can't think of the analogy. Rubbernecking? Yeah. A little bit. Car, just, oh. you, 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 you enjoy the disaster. Like, mm -hmm. you know, watching for a wreck in NASCAR. That's why people watch NASCAR races, you wait for the wreck. There's a part of that. But the main thing was, at the end of the day, do you follow Rex? Do you not follow Rex? Do you knock on the door? Do you not knock on the door? For me, it was, I wanted Rex to have a chance to say mm -hmm. whatever it is he might have wanted to say about his tenure and the firing with the Bills. Yeah. And there was another case, too, that another media member told us that they went to the door of Marshawn Lynch when he got traded. And he was... Tra yeah, he was it traded. It was Swenson. Yeah, and, it was and, Scott Swenson from And he said that Marshawn said, come on in. Mm -hmm. Come on in. Yeah, of course. Yeah, we'll, we'll do an interview. I, I, want it. I want to have my say. I, mm -hmm. want to, I, I want to do this. You know, he had the chance to do it. So it was... Uh, it was surreal, yeah, to yeah. say the least, um, to be on a, a wild goose chase with, uh, with Rex Ryan. Uh, Rex is fired. His brother Rob is fired. The next day, uh, Anthony Lynn has to face the music to the media. He didn't fire Rex. The Pagulas mm -hmm. and Doug Whaley fired Rex, but they're not talking to anybody. So here's the interim guy. Go out there and break a leg. Fed to the wolves. And he was yeah. lambasted that day, and, it, and there was nothing he could have done. And yeah. mainly it was about the quarterback, you know, because, yep. again, one of the big reasons that Rex got fired when he did was about playing Tyrod or not playing Tyrod. And Anthony Lynn was sent out to face the media without marching orders of what to say and what he was going to do. And it was a, just another of the litany of terrible things for the way the Bills handled that firing, that changeover, and that media week before the Jets came. And it was apparent the minute that that microphone was turned yep. on. Yep. And he said that Cardell Jones is going to be the starter, and we all went, what? And he went, oh, I'm sorry. It was E.J. Manuel. Yeah. And we all went like, oh, he has, oh, he has no idea what's yeah. happening. Who's your starting quarterback for Sunday? <laughs> uh, Cordell Jones right now. I mean, I'm sorry. I said not Cordell, but uh, E.J. Manuel. Lynn says the manual will start in the final and reveals that it was a front office decision, not his decision, yep. uh, yeah. to start E.J. Manuel in the season finale. And then uh, Sunday, January 1st, right on the eve of right before the regular season finale, multiple reports that it's Lynn's job to lose. Uh, the the Lynn-led Buffalo Bills take on the New York Jets. E.J. Manuel, 9 of 20, he was bad. Cardell Jones wasn't much better. 6 of 11 for 96 yards. Jets win 30 to 10. Less said about that game, the better. Yeah. I'm driving back from the Meadowlands as Doug Whaley has his league-mandated end-of-the-season press conference. And uh, you guys were there. Just how surreal was that one? It, you know, it wasn't surreal. It, the funny thing was is that while it was going on, I'm like, you know, he's, get, he's supposed to get skewered here, and he's getting skewered, but he's, he's surviving it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then the more you walk back, watch it again, you're like, 
wait, why did he say that? And what, why, did, yeah. why did he not know about this? He was almost sent out there to face the media with less information than Anthony Lynn had. And, and the fact is, whereas Lynn tried to spin and say, well, it was a group decision or, you know, we, this is why we're doing this. Well, it was just like, and nobody let me in the meeting, so I don't know what's going on, you know? <laughs> that was the best call. Is that you understood that you're like, yeah, you know what, it was over Rex's head. That, that was the decision was over Rex's head. And you're like, it was even more over Anthony Lynn's head. Yeah. And you're like, but the guy, it can't, it can't be over the head of right. the general manager. Right. And you're like, oh my gosh, it's over his head yeah. too, or at least that's what he's saying. Right. And you couldn't think of any better lie. You knew every question <laughs> that was going to come to Doug Whaley that day. Especially that question. And, and every question came for, <laughs> and he seemed like, um, no, I wasn't privy. I wasn't privy. <laughs> privy became a word. Yeah. Privy, yeah. privy was the word. I wasn't privy to the conversation. Again, I was not privy to the details of the conversation. I wasn't privy to any part of Rex Ryan being fired until I was told. So again, I wasn't privy to that conversation. I was not privy to that conversation. The, yeah. Totally right though. The most inexcusable part of it wasn't that the GM didn't know. Is that he told everybody he didn't know. Was you just, just like, how do you? That's that's PR 101. That's running a football franchise 101. As bad as the Bills have been, none of their previous GMs or coaches have said anything. So dumb. And it was yeah. like I said, it was Rex doesn't know how to run defense, so and so doesn't know how to do this. And you're like, but the GM has to know what's going on. You're like, the GM doesn't know what's going on. It's like, so does anybody know what's going on? And and it, like that that's what we took took out of that press conference was who's calling the shots? And yeah. that team that team still won seven games, by the way. Unbelievable. Yeah, they still won seven and nine. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Whaley says he's not privy to the conversation that happened between uh, Terry and Rex about the firing. Says this will be his first coaching search. You've been a part of three. No, 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 no. That was, it was a group decision when we hired Rex, and that was the last guy's decision when we hired uh, Doug Marone. So this is the first time I get to lead a coaching mm -hmm. search, and that w was met with the biggest, you know, suspicious eye mm -hmm. ever. Uh, Whaley denied knowing that Rex was in trouble. Hasn't thought about if it was the right move or not. Mm. What do you mean you didn't have a thought that it was the right move or not? You're just like, well, it happened. Nothing. Just no thoughts whatsoever. Yeah, um, yeah the, it wasn't just that uh, the Western New York media cut down the bills and Doug Whaley at this moment. The national media got to see the circus too. Mm -hmm. And this is on Black Monday, a day when guys are getting fired all over the league and national media members are like, how is that guy not getting fired too? Yeah, and like you said, it's Black Monday. There are many other big stories going on. Everybody was talking about the Doug Whaley press conference yep. and how terrible it was. Yeah. And I wonder if Whaley does not get fired, if he, he handles, handles that, that better. better. I think he probably still does because if you're not privy to it, then the owner probably knows what he's going to do anyway. And someone may have talked him into, let's keep him through the draft and let him handle that, and then we'll get rid of him after the draft. But um, there's no doubt after that press conference. Because but before the press conference, you know, I, I was having arguments with fans about, well, you know, well, he's done this, this, and this good, this, this, and this bad. Yeah. You can make a case for... You, you I mean, can weigh it both ways. The, the records under Doug Whaley were the best of, of, of the drought. And now, obviously, a very low bar, but whatever. Best yeah. is best. Um, but after that press conference, it was done, and it had to be done. Yeah. Then later that same night, Terry Pagula tells the Associated Press that the firing happened over a phone call that he had with Rex Ryan and says there's no dysfunction. Quote, there is no dysfunction. Everybody is on the same page. We are busy busting our asses. Mm -hmm. What a perfect way to Because that, that was the word. That was dysfunction. It was, yeah. it was dysfunction under Rex. Rex was gone. And there's still dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So where is so where where does it go? You know, if you cut the head off the snake or whatever, where, where how high up does this go? <laughs> and you're going, oh, it's it's all the way to the top. top yeah, that, that, yeah. That's where this dysfunction begins. Yeah. If you have to say there's no dysfunction, there's yeah, mm -hmm. there's lots of dysfunction to go around. And I think that's kind of the, the the best spot to kind of end this episode because you know things have happened obviously since then. Sean McDermott is hired. Tyrod Taylor's contract's restructured. Doug Whaley gets fired. Uh, Watkins' fifth-year option declined, and Brandon Bean is hired. But um, you know, none of those things have produced anything on a football field yet. Right. We don't know if McDermott will be good. We don't know if Brandon Bean will make any good decisions. He hasn't he hasn't really made a decision yet as GM uh, of the Buffalo Bills. So um, yeah, we're at the present now. Mm. And uh, fellas, just to, to think about this year and frame it along with the giant. Uh, malaise of uh, these 17 years. This season was maybe the one coming off the 2015 season, which had some of the highest optimism I could ever remember week one. This one was as dead as I can remember, ever remember week one. Training camp at St. John Fisher was as quiet and uninteresting as any of them have been. I mean, it, it was the worst camp. And yet this season had enough, you know, it, I'll put it this way. It was the least anticipated season 
with a coach that could not avoid the circus atmosphere. So you were bad, everyone thought you'd be bad, yeah. and then you were stupid and blew things up left and right. That On didn't need to be blown. It. Exactly. That, 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 that was just one of those head scratching seasons where you're like, it can't get any worse than this. You're like, oh, wait. It does, just, yeah. Just wait till Wednesday when the media, when, when they have to talk to the, the media. The hold my beer line in Twitter <laughs> was coined by this bill season. And, and that's how it goes. And, and, and going, like you said, Prescott, into this year, it's, it's so many question marks. We, and, and I go, you know, last year you kind of knew going in like what you had. You knew what you had with Tyrod Taylor and, and so on and so forth. And it's like, none of the questions really answered. We're, we're just as confused going into this year of, is this stuff going to work going ahead? Yeah, yeah. And uh, Thad, as you and I have, have sat there here for these last 17 weeks now, going over the Bills and their playoff drought, what have you taken away? What have you learned about yourself, about the Bills, <laughs> about anything? looking over these 17 years. It's reminded me that the Bills have gone through this cycle more than once. That whatever new idea, they're going to come out and roll out there and tell you this is the answer, nobody knows. There will come a time, there has to, where they <laughs> figure it out. But for, for anybody sure. to tell you before there's been a win or a loss with any regime that this regime has it figured out is fooling themselves. Because there have been many times where everything we heard from Sean McDermott, I heard going back through the Marv Levy presser. Greg Williams sounded a whole heck of a lot like Rex Ryan and Doug Marone. There have been repeats over and over with this. The Bills have spun their wheels literally for 17 years. So don't tell me that you know this is going to be right. Don't tell me you've got it figured out. We'll know when the Bills have a check mark next to their name in the standings <laughs> and a game scheduled after week 17. Yeah, because that, that's what I came out of, the McDermott thing. And I know we're not going to see it, but I was like, yeah, yeah, these guys are really buying in. This guy's really good. And you're like, heard it before, Dan. <laughs> yeah. Heard it before. And I'm like, oh, all right, yeah, you're right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, we are busy busting our asses. Terry Pagula's last words on the 2016 season. And maybe that's how they'll be in 2017. And, hey, maybe, maybe we don't have to do an 18th it, year of this. It could work this year. It, it could. It, it will. The one thing, the one other thing I'm absolutely sure of, they will make the playoffs at some point. It will happen. How could you? How could it not? Yeah, I mean, right. <laughs> they're due. The Lions had a winless season. They've been in the yeah. playoffs more recently. The Houston Texans didn't exist when the drought started. When the drought started, <laughs> and they have been in the playoffs multiple times since then. The Bills have to figure it out, right? Tom Brady's not going to be quarterback forever. Bill Belichick's not mm -hmm. going to be head coach forever. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to figure this out at some point, right? Mm -hmm. They will. They will. You know, it may not be this year. Maybe we make it to 20. The drought may be able to vote and drink and rent a car. <laughs> but they will eventually find a way to get to the playoffs. And then eventually the drought will get on Social Security. So we have reached <laughs> the end of Down and Drought. If you have watched all 17 episodes, I will mail you $40. <laughs> well, not mail you $40. But some thanks to give. First off, a thank you to Jeremy Mengsing, our great graphics guy, for developing this fancy logo that you see behind Thad. <laughs> Well done. <laughs> that should be the image for the show. Yeah, uh, yeah that, that is uh, his work, and uh, we really love it. We want us to thank all the directors that we've had for 17 episodes. Sean Bowerman, Mike Herschel, Ishmael Rivera, Tim Lemoy. Dan, you have smashed the buttons a few times. I pressed buttons. We appreciate that greatly. Uh, to everyone on the staff that helped in with uh, Abe Lincoln quotes at the beginning of episodes, a lot of people have asked me, like, what's, what's the story behind that? Oh, uh, I just love Abe Lincoln, um, and uh, I think it was just a, a cool little way to kind of have a quote that it kind of gives a, a theme or a metaphor for the season to come in the following episode of Down and Drought. And to people saying you shouldn't trivialize America's greatest president by tying his best quotes to a crappy Bills team, I say, yeah, so. <laughs> I did anyway. Um, and then uh, and, and a thanks to a few websites that have obviously been instrumental without this pro football reference. I mean, this doesn't happen without every box score, mm -hmm. every game log, right. all the drives. I Love mean, that site. Yeah, that, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had to consult it multiple times for mm -hmm. hours for every single one of these episodes. Billsdaily.com. They've done a, yep. a terrific job chronicling every day all the press conferences, all the little tidbits that happen. Um, obviously, Twitter has obviously been great. ESPN, Buffalo News, and you know they've had some terrific writers over these 17 years. And being able to go back and read an old Jerry Sullivan column or an old Tim Graham feature or a Mark Gaughan report from, from some game, it's just been a really cool and valuable resource for this project. And of course, thanks to the fellows that have joined us on this mm -hmm. little podium here. Uh, Dan Fates, Matt Fairburn, Mark Ludwizak, Ryan Nagelhout, John Kutchko, Mark Ruba, Dave Yates, Thad Brown. I'm Prescott Rossi. Thank you for watching Down and Drop.
Yay. We did it. We're not alcoholics yet? I'm going to be. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Prescott's like, speak for yourself. <laughs>